We are live. Good morning. Uh, the meeting will now come to order. Welcome to the July 27th, 2021 meeting of the Durham Board of Adjustment. My name is Jacob Rogers. I'm the chair of the board. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are conducting this meeting using a remote electronic platform as permitted by session law 2020-3. The Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial body that is governed by the North Carolina General Statutes and the City's Unified Development Ordinance. The Board typically conducts evidentiary hearings on requests for variances, special use permits, among other requests. Today's meeting will proceed much like an in-person meeting of the Board. On the screen, you'll see members of the Board of Adjustment, additionally planning staff and representatives from the City and County's Attorney's Offices are attending as well. Applicants, proponents, and opponents were required to register in advance and are also attending the remote meeting. When a case is be, uh, called for its hearing, speakers will be promoted within the remote platform so their video can be seen. I will swear in applicants and witnesses at the beginning of each case. Staff will present each case and the applicants will then provide their evidence. Control of the presentation and screen sharing will remain with planning staff. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on the city's YouTube site and a link to this broadcast broadcast is on the website for the Board of Adjustment. Before we begin uh, the evidentiary hearings on today's agenda, I'd like to provide some important information about steps taken to ensure that each party's due process rights are protected as we proceed in this platform. Each applicant on today's agenda was notified that this meeting would be conducting using a remote electronic platform. During registration, every applicant on today's agenda consented to the Board conducting the evidentiary hearing using the remote platform. We will also confirm today at the start of each uh, hearing that the participants in the hearing consent to the matter proceeding in this platform. Um, and if not, the uh, if there's an objection to a matter proceeding, uh, the case will be continued. Notice of today's meeting was provided by publishing notice in the newspaper, mailed to property owners within 600 feet of subject properties, posting a sign at the property, and posting on the city's website. The newspaper, website, and mail notices for today's meeting contain information how the public can access the remote meeting as it occurs. These notices also contain information about the registration requirement, uh, along with information about how to register. All individuals participating in today's evidentiary hearings were also required to submit a copy of any presentation, document, exhibit, or other material that they wished uh, to submit at the evidentiary hearing prior to today's meeting. All materials that the city received from participants in today's cases, as well as a copy of city staff's presentations and documents were posted on the Board of Adjustment website as part of the agenda. No new documents will be submitted during today's meeting. All decisions of this board are subject to appeal to the Durham Superior Court. Anyone in the audience other than the applicant who wishes to receive a copy of the formal order issued by this board on a particular case must submit a written request uh, for a copy of the order. I want to welcome everyone here. It's good to see you. Uh, we've got um, serving as our, uh, uh, well, first of all, let's do a roll call. Uh, and Jessica, you going to take this over? Yes, sir. I will. Jessica Dockery, planning staff. All right. Rogers? Here. Mr. Meadows, you are muted. There you go. I'm here. Kip? Here. Retchless? Here. R Wymore? Here. Jeter? Here. Tarrant? Here. Major? You said here, Miss Major. Okay, sorry, yeah. I missed it. And Bouchain? Here. Thank you. All right. Uh, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Eliza, I think we've got one or a call. Yes, uh, good morning, Eliza Monroe with the Planning Department. Um, I would like to note that case B2100031 will be removed from this agenda as the applicant requested to go to a, another meeting. Um, so we will not be hearing case number B21003031, which is a county case for a Unipol. We'll be hearing that at the next available meeting. All right, thank you. Um, our next item on the agenda is the approval from the minutes of our June uh, meeting. Uh, I hope everyone's had a chance to look over those. And if you have, is there a motion to approve them? Meadows, move approval. Got a motion by Mr. Meadows to approve. Is there a second? Reg Rachel, Reg second. All right. Jessica, you want to take it away? Sure. Rogers? Yes. Meadows? Yes. 
Kip. Yes. Wretchless. Yes. Wymore. Yes. Jeter. Yes. Boucher. Yes. All right. Okay. Motion pass it carries seven to zero. Good deal. All right. Well, let's just dive right on in this. Um, Jessica, you want to call the first case? Sure. Our first case is B21000011, a city case. It's a request for a minor special use permit to allow fill in the floodway fringe. The subject site is located at 1730 TW Alexander Drive, is zoned industrial light, and in the suburban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet and neighborhood organizations have been notified, notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letting, letter mailings are on file. And the seating will be Rogers, Meadows, Kip, Wretchless, Wymore, Jeter, and Boucher. All right. Uh, and before we continue, uh, Tisha, I know you you sent me a note. You're going to be you're going to have to step out at 11. Round 11. Yes. Okay. I just want to make make note of that now. Uh, all right. Um, and we've got uh, Mike Tarrant here as well. So good deal. Um, Eliza, is it? Is this yours? Yes. I'm promoting. There's a little bit of a lag. I'm promoting the um, attendees over to panelists. And it looks like someone might have shared a link. So it's going to be three of the same name. So we're going to have to clear that up so we can make sure we're calling everyone by the right name. Um, but there seems to be a little bit of a lag as we're getting everybody to come over. So uh, speaking of, if there, if anybody has, um, I'm, I'm, let's go ahead and mention Jessica Major has joined the meeting as well. Um, if you plan on giving testimony today, we'll need your camera on to administer the oath. Um, so everyone should be in now. Um, and if everyone could also spell out your name when you identify yourself so we can change your names here. Um, since we've got three Ladidras. <laughs> All right, should we figure this out now? Um, yeah. How are we doing um, this? <laughs> This is, um, this is Jamie Schwather. I just renamed myself in the in the Zoom itself. I don't know if that came through for you all. It yes. did. Um, Ladidra in the blue polo, would you mind doing the same? And that's Earl Llewellyn. Right. <laughs> we'll now <laughs> forever be referred to as Ladidra in the blue polo. <laughs> Got this. All right. Uh, if you plan on giving testimony, please raise your right hand. Do you, um, uh, sorry, one more, it looks oh, like from Kimberly. Kimberly. Yes. And Kimberly Horn Smith. Who we also need to identify right. as well. Um, All right, we're gonna, I guess uh, if they're not gonna, we'll need the, your video on. All right. That's, that's Ashton Smith with Kinley Horn. And if Ashton, if you could um, click the little ellipsis dots and just rename yourself in the Zoom there. Great. All right. And I'm, I'm guessing you, Kessler may have uh, stepped away for a moment. We'll get, you know, if we need to swear in later, we can. So if you do plan on giving testimony, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, and I'll call on each one of you, that the testimony today you'll give is the truth and nothing but the truth. Um, Jamie? Yes, I do. Ashton? You're on mute, sir. Yes, I do. All right, Jarvis? Yes. Ladidra? I am the actual Ladidra, but I won't be giving testimony today. <laughs> okay. Uh, Earl? I do. Travis? I do. All right, and uh, also, do you consent to this remote meeting platform? I'll need an answer from each of you, Travis? Yes. Earl? Yes. Ladidra. Yes. Jarvis? Yes. Ashton? Yes. And Jamie? Yes. All right. Eliza, take it away. Okie dokie. Thanks so much, everybody, for working with us through that. Okay. Um, should be able to now see my screen. Um, so good morning, everyone. Eliza Monroe here representing the planning department. 
Um, uh, cleaning staff does request that the staff record all materials submitted at the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noticed. So noted, thank you. Thank you. Case B210011 is a request for a minor special use permit to allow fill in the floodway fringe, non-encroachment area fringe, flood future conditions flood hazard areas, or areas of shallow flooding. The applicant is Kimley Horn & Associates, and the subject site is located at 1730 TW Alexander Drive. The case area is highlighted in red on the screen. Um, the site is zoned light industrial, or IL, and is located in the suburban tier. And this looks a little bit different than some of our other maps. Um, so you're going to see here we have the floodway that's going to be hatched here as well as floodplain, just to kind of show what that looks like on the site currently. Um, the subject site is currently vacant. Uh, large areas of the parcel are covered in what's considered flood emergency management agency or FEMA mapped floodplain and floodway as well as riparian stream buffers and regulated wetlands. Um, and this image here is kind of a little bit better showing what exactly is being requested. Um, so per section 8.4.4D.1 of the Unified Development Ordinance, any fill or development in the floodway fringe or non, and or non-encroachment area fringe that is not under the approval authority of the floodplain administrator requires the approval of a minor special use permit by the Board of Adjustment. Given the environmental features on the site, the applicant is proposing to fill 1.35 acres of floodplain fringe on the site. The fill and walls within the floodplains are proposed to support the west and south areas, the south parking areas of building number two, so right along here. And fill is also proposed for the stormwater control measure or SEM located to the south of building number two, which is right over here. No habitable structures are proposed to be located within the floodplain and the grade of the parking lots essentially are being raised to exceed the two foot freeboard requirement by six feet, which is a um, requirement that's mentioned in section 8.4.3F.1 of the EEO. Um, the wall and grades that support the parking lot only extend far enough to raise it above the freeboard and do not extend any further than necessary. There are a total of three industrial buildings proposed on either side of the floodway. So this little area here, you'll note that there's nothing directly within it. And the three industrial buildings are kind of um, on either side of it. And the proposed design does not encroach into the floodway, the riparian stream buffer, or any other regulated wetlands on site. It's just going to be inside of this area here, the floodplain or the floodway, um, the floodplain fringe, excuse me. Uh, we don't have a lot of these cases very often. We haven't had one since 2019. So if any of, the com any of the text or any of the language is a little bit confusing or if we want to go over it, myself and the applicant, of course, will make sure that the board understands um, in order to make an educated decision. Uh, UDO section 3.9.8 A and B establishes four findings and 13 review factors that the applicant must meet in order for the board to grant a use permit. Additionally, UDO section 3.98 C establishes 11 review factors for development in special flood hazard areas and future condition flood hazard areas. So you'll note within the staff report, as well as when the applicant's responses, there's gonna be 11 additional factors that are required to be responded to and that the board should take into consideration when making their decision. All of those findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings and review factors are identified in the application, both of which are within your packet. And there were also several other attachments and documents about floodplain, um, as well as different certificates that were included as well. Uh, staff will be available for any questions as needed during the hearing process. And I will now kind of open it up to everyone else. Thank you. Uh, Chad, do you have a question? Good morning. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Eliza. Um, I have three questions. Um, some you you may be able to answer. Some you may want to uh, pass to the applicant. Um, the first one should I just give them to you and then let you go, or do you want them in order? Um, just let's hear them. Let's I'm going to probably them. write a little bit on this. Okay. So I'd like to know um, why this isn't in the floodplain administrator's wheelhouse or jurisdiction, or why this decision. Um, you know, has, has moved over to the Board of Adjustment. The second question I wanted to just get some clarity on. Um, I think I heard you and I think I understand that the UDO requires surface parking to be above the free board. So I wanted to, I wanted to be sure that that was in fact, that I'm understanding that correctly. And then finally, the last question, 
um, will the filling um, and the structures impede the stream's ability to accommodate flood water? So those are my three questions. Okay. Um, so of those questions, I know for certain I can answer the first two and then I'll allow the applicant to answer the third question, okay. um, which is about the stream's ability to um, still function properly with this proposed 1.35 acres of fill in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, so in answering the different jurisdictions, Jurisdictions, and I apologize, I'm looking up text on the side here, um, into what the floodplain administrator is allowed to do as opposed to what the board's allowed to do and what's approved by right. So mm -hmm. technically, if you're looking in section 8.4.4a of the code, mm -hmm. development and land disturbance areas within the special flood hazard area and the future conditions flood hazard area is prohibited, technically. However, there are some exceptions. Um, so development that's allowed by right with no special approvals are like architectural uses like active ar agriculture or excuse me, agricultural uses like agri active agriculture, um, pasture forestry, wildlife sanctuary, um, lawns and gardens, those types of things are allowed by right without any additional approval. Mm -hmm. When it comes to development requiring the floodplain administrator approval, we're going to be looking at single family or duplex structures. Um, we're going to be are permitted by right um, and any such accessory structures like driveways or walkways or utility crossings, those things the floodplain administrator can review. Um, let's see what else. Uh, new construction um, that flood proofing or elevation by design in lieu of required fill for new construction or substantial improvements on lots of records that were recorded before January 1st, 2006, which is the adoptive date of our ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, those things as well, that, that's something that the floodplain administrator can also approve. Um, the following uses like parks and playgrounds, uh, utility crossings, crossings by streets and driveways, those things can also um, be approved by the floodplain administrator. Um, development requiring a modern special use permit is going to be filler development in the floodplain fringe, non-encroachment area fringe or future conditions flood hazard area. Um, fill or development in the floodway or non-encroachment area um, as well that also includes like crossings by streets, driveways, pedestrian walkways, those things that um, those things would require the board of adjustment. Any fill that may be a, a part of supporting any of those uses like the utility uses or um, uh, public facilities or things of that sort, those would require the board um, adjustment approval as opposed to the smaller projects in which the floodplain administrator could approve. Um, so there's a little bit different levels. By right, technically nothing is proved, but then there's small allowances depending upon the nature of the intensity. And, and just to follow up, thank you for that. Um, so this project is, is, is of a scope and a nature that is significant enough that the UDO um, is, is drafted to require this board to make the decision instead of the floodplain administrator. That is correct. This is okay. outside of the scope of the floodplain administrator. Thank you. The floodplain administrator did review the project. I will make that note and sure. um, also assisted staff, uh, since I'm not a floodplain administrator and don't necessarily have all those certs, um, they also assisted me in looking at the staff report as well as um, were a part of the site plan review. And mm -hmm. at this time, they don't have any further comments. Okay. Um, and then with regards to the second question, we were talking about the requirement of the free board. Um, to give you one moment to scroll up a little bit to that part. Okay. Um, second question was about parking as it relates to the free board. So it's more so the requirement of, so sorry, uh, my iPad and I don't usually get this much love together. Um, so there are standards for development within the floodplain administrate, within the floodplain or within these special flood hazard or future conditions, flood hazard areas. Um, and so that creates instead the standard of fill or material and what needs to be done and they have to create essentially an elevation that is two feet above the BFE or the base flood elevation or the future conditions flood elevation. In this case, parking is going to be the use that's going to be going in. So we would require that parking to be at least two feet above that. And the applicant is actually providing walls and support that would bring it up six feet above as opposed to just the two feet. So they're exceeding the expectation um, that we would have within section 
3.4.3a of the Unified Development Ordinance. Could, could I follow on with that? I just want to be sure I understood what you said. It, it sounded to me like the, the way the rules are drafted, if we allow any fill in the floodplain or, or a special flood hazard area, let's just call it that. If there's any fill in the special flood hazard area, then there must be enough fill to get uh, to it, to get past the freeboard. To get past that base flood elevation, that's correct. So we're not going to. Uh, okay. In simple terms, we're not going to permit something that's then in a couple of years going to have an issue because we know this area is a flat, um, a potential area where there's flooding. So we need to raise it above that base flood elevation or that future conditions flood elevation, so we can at least give the development a running chance to not be damaged by flood flooding, potential flooding. Thank you. Um, and I think I'm going to pass the third one off, which I hope you wrote down to the applicant about the stream's ability to um, withstand based upon this proposed fill. All right, we'll, we'll wait till we hear from them. Any other questions for Eliza before we move forward? I'm just going to go through here. I don't see any speak up. I'm not seeing any either. Thank you. All right. Uh, would the applicant come forward? Uh, Jamie, is this, are you representing? It is, Mr. Chair. All right, take it over. Thank you. And we had prepared a PowerPoint if that could be um, brought up while we're getting ready here. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the Board of Adjustment. I'm Jamie Schwather with Parker Poe at 301 Fayetteville Street here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Trinity Capital Advisors. Next slide, please. Trinity plans to construct three industrial buildings in an industrial area to accommodate the growing need for distribution in the Triangle. This development is important to Trinity and to the Durham community because it will provide industrial space to attend and bringing jobs to the TWO Alexandria, Alexander Industrial Area. This slide shows the site plan for the project. And as you can see, a floodway runs through the center of the property and will be the central uh, discussion point in our presentation today. Building one will be located on the west side of the floodway and the placement of buildings two and three on the east side of the central floodway requires this minor filling of the floodplain fringe on only 1.35 acres of the 53 acre property. Hence our uh, request for the minor special use permit today. Um, next slide, please. As Eliza mentioned, this special use permit requires three sets of factors. These special use uh, factors on your screen. Next slide, please. These special use review factors under 3.9.8B. And finally, next slide, please. The limited use standards, uh, which there are many. Um, and because the, I'm, I'm understanding that there's, this is kind of a, a, a not seldom seen uh, and not frequently seen request, and there are significant overlaps between these factors, we've organized our evidence, um, if you'll advance to the next slide, please, by topic, which often relates to multiple factors. Today, you will hear the evidence in order of these topics related to each of these factors and in the order of these four witnesses. This chart shows each topic how they relate to the general finding in the middle column and the review factors in the other columns um, in, in addition to the limited use standards. First, you'll hear from Mr. Travis Caldwell with Trinity Capital about the need and, and importance of this industrial development and how the nature of the use will fit into the overall industrial context of the area. Second, Ashton Smith, a civil engineer at Kimley Horn, will testify as to the UDO compliance and zoning and comprehensive plan policies including lighting, signs, utilities, and open space, as well as a discussion of uh, safety, welfare, and the flood impacts related to protection policies and the extent of fill in the floodway. Third, you'll hear from Mr. Earl Llewellyn, a transportation engineer with Kimley Horn, who will testify as to circulation, parking, and loading, service entrances and areas, and show how these relate to safety and welfare. And finally, Mr. Jarvis Martin, a certified appraiser, will testify as to harmony with the surrounding area and impacts to property values. Um, as Eliza noted, we've submitted exhibits in advance and we'll further those throughout the case. Um, and we've also incorporated them into the slides to il illustrate the testimony. And I'll ask at the end of this, if this PowerPoint can also be um, added into evidence. I'd like at this time to call our first witness, Mr. Travis Caldwell. Travis, are you with us? I am. Please state your name and address for the board. Uh, Travis Caldwell, office address is 440 South Church Street, Suite 800, Charlotte, North Carolina. Can you please describe your background and Trinity's plans for this use? Um, I'm a senior development manager for Trinity Capital Advisors, which owns the two parcels subject mm -hmm. to this request. 
Trinity acquired this property specifically for industrial use in December and began to prepare for this special use permit. Since then, we have secured a confidential industrial tenant who we believe will be a strong asset to the community and the area. This approval is part of our obligation to provide the site to them. Thank you. And can you explain this project and the importance of the proposed use to the area? Yes, this project involves three industrial buildings on the south side of TW Alexander Boulevard, just east of the intersection with Miami Boulevard, and is also adjacent to Research Triangle Park. The area is dominated by industrial uses, and I believe the next slide shows those uses. Um, Bluebird and Amazon Fulfillment Center to the north of the site, GE Aviation to the south, and Peter Millar Warehouse, Power Secure, and Cintas Uniform Services to the southwest. The importance of industrial uses were made all the more clear during the pandemic when consumers began to see how supply chain logistics could impact their daily lives. As individual demand continues to grow, this development is needed to accommodate the growth in the area. Thank you, Mr. Caldwell. Are there any questions for this witness? Any questions for Mr. Caldwell? All right, looks like we're good. All right, if none, I'll excuse Mr. Caldwell and call our next witness, Mr. Ashton Smith. And you could advance to the next slide, please. Mr. Smith, could you please state your name and address for the board? Ashton Smith, uh, address is at 421 Fayetteville Street, Suite 600 in Raleigh, North Carolina, 27601. And can you describe your background and experience, please? I'm a civil engineer, got a bachelor's degree from NC State University in 2005. Um, I'm licensed in the state of North Carolina. I have over 15 years of civil engineering experience. I'm a senior project manager at Gimli Horn and have worked with the firm for the last seven months. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to tender Mr. Smith as an expert in the field of civil engineering and site layout. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, can you explain your role uh, in this project? Uh, Gimli Horn was uh, engaged to create the layout and design for the facility shown and has overseen the site plan middle process. I have reviewed the applicable UDO re regulations, including requirements for layout, safety, and environmental protection. My team at Kimberly Horn created the site plan for the proposed development and provided the plans and certifications to the city of Durham. Okay, great. And are you prepared to testify as to certain factors related to the permit today? Yes, I'll be testifying with respect to UDO compliance and safety and welfare. This includes uh, conformance with the UDO and use requirements, consistency with the comprehensive plan and how the layout relates to lighting, signs, utilities, open space, screening, buffering, and landscaping, environmental protection, and the safety and welfare of the public. These are factors two of three of the general findings and factors four through nine, 12, and 13 of the SCP review factors in the UDO, 3.9.8.B and factors one, three, and six through 10 of the limited use standards. With respect to the UDO compliance and the comprehensive plan, the property is zoned IL, industrial light, which allows the proposed industrial warehousing use subject to a SUP per section 4.3.6 of the comprehensive plan. The IL district is established to provide it for a wide range of light manufacturing warehousing and wholesaling activities, as well as offices and support services. It is the intent of the district to offer sites for those industries whose operations, exposure, location, or traffic have minimal impacts on adjacent properties. The future land use map designation is industrial, and the project is within the suburban tier. Policy 1.2.C of the comp plan supports that such development in the suburban tier and close to the RTP. This policy notes that land located in the suburban tier is expected to accommodate a large portion of the Durham's growth through greenfield development, infill, and redevelopment. While the suburban tier is expected to primarily develop at traditional suburban densities and patterns, it is recognized that the research triangle part may develop with more intense development. The proposed industrial building use is consistent with the uses uh, contemplated in the IL district and suburban tier 
as the project will accommodate the growing need for distribution in Durham area, especially near the RTP. Satisfying SP factors 12 and limited use standard eight. Thank you, Mr. Smith. But before moving on, did, I just wanted to clarify, I think your mic cut out. Would you, were you referring to policy 2.1.2C of the comprehensive plan? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, with respect to the UDO compliance in connection with the site layout, the slide show, this slide shows the overall layout of the three buildings. Streams run through the center of the site, uh, shown, in, as shown in green hatching, which is the actual tree save area on top of the, the floodplain um, or the flood way. Um, let's see. Uh, and with this, the way the streams divide up the site, the site is developed into two uh, separate kind of building pad areas one on the west and one on the east. Building one is to the west of the stream and it's on the left side of the screen. And building two, buildings two and three are on the east, on the right side of the screen. The blue areas show the stormwater detention ponds, uh, the magenta circles, they're real small, um, are the light poles. Um, exterior lighting for the site will be largely screened by the floodway, stream buffers, tree coverage areas and will reduce the impact of lighting to nearby properties. And all outdoor lighting will be designed in compliance with the requirements of section 7.4 of the EDO. In addition to internal, in addition, um, directional signs on the site are indicated on the screen by yellow circles. There will be non, there will be a non illuminated monument sign to identify the site. On the by the driveways, all signs will be designed in compliance with requirements of Article 11 of the UDO. Uh, the site will have direct access to city water with existing lines that run along TW Alexander Drive and to city sewer with existing lines that run along the southern portions of the property. These are shown on the screen and in more detail on the site plan on pages C5 1 through C5 3. Existing trees will be preserved in the riparian buffers and tree save areas to preserve floodways along the central, eastern, and southern portions of the property, which again are shown in the green hatched areas on the screen. In addition, 10 foot street yard buffers will be located along TW Alexander Drive. Um, a 10 foot side yard buffer will be located along the western property line fronting the Power Secure LLC warehouse. There are these buffers are shown in the solid green. Each side of the stream running through the central and eastern portions of the property will be bordered by a 50 foot riparian buffer and a 10 foot no build setback is outside of that. In addition to the 10 foot landscape buffers and the 20 foot building setbacks, there will be that there will be a 20 foot building setback that is provided along the western and eastern portions of the property and a 20 foot landscape buffer and 40 foot building setback that is provided along the northern portion of the property face of TW Alexander Drive. The undisturbed floodway will serve as a natural buffer along the remaining southern portions of the property. Can you flip to the next slide, please? This slide shows the environmental protection aspects and minimal amounts of fill in the floodplain. Development proposes uh, 58. 1,806 square feet of disturbance in the floodplain on the east portion of the property to construct the parking lots on the west side of building two and the east side of building three, as well as portions of the wet detention pond located south of building two. The fill area has been minimized to the extent it's practical in an effort to minimize the impact to the site. The balance of the site has been designed to mimic existing conditions uh, to be graded in the way they are in uh, pre-existing conditions to minimize impacts to the floodway areas. The proposed development will result in, a, in all three buildings having a finished floor elevation, FFE, that is at least two feet above the FEMA flood elevation per city of Durham requirements. In the course of the review of this site plan and the SEP, we provided 
flood study calculations which show the site features structures located within the floodplain have been designed to meet all applicable flood proofing requirements. Per the city of Durham requirements, those calculations identified the flood impacts to the site, including expected heights, velocities, duration, and rates of rise. Proposed storm inlets and the two stormwater wet ponds are located at low points of the site and will be maintained as such to enable water to draw down on-site rain events. This will allow also ensure uh, compliance with the UDO requirements to preserve water quality on the site and surrounding areas. The project is not expected to require governmental services following flood events. This property is not considered a waterfront location, so the standard regarding the necessity of, for a waterfront location does not apply to this site. This project as designed meets all applicable flood proofing requirements and will be in harmony with the surrounding area. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I, I'd like to, I think you answered um, Mr. Meadows question, but just to, just to reiterate, um, will this fill impact um, the stream's ability to function um, with the project as designed? No, the, the stream will still be able to function and with flood water still be able to come through and not, not cause any issues. Thank you. I think we've got a question. Ch Chad, do you have one? I do. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. That was, that was very helpful. Just a couple more questions for you. You said that the amount of filling was minimal. Um, two questions. Um, would there have been less fill necessary if the lot had 442 spaces instead of 449? And also kind of concomitantly, um, I noticed that there's some landscaping along the edge of the parking lot. I understand that's a UDO requirement. If, um, would, would there have been less fill had it not been necessary to install that landscaping? I'm, I'm talking mostly about building two, by the way. I'm sorry to be vague. I'm, I'm most interested in the uh, portion of building two, I guess the west side of building two, the large area, the larger area of, of fill. Um, and you know whether or not um, a reduction in the number of parking spaces and or um, deviation from the landscaping requirements would have resulted in less fill along the west side of building two. Uh, the, the landscaping, there's not not really much on that side that's uh, adjacent to the, to the floodplain that's got the fill. So I, I don't think any reduction in landscaping is really going to have an impact. Okay. Um, the parking, I mean, it's a double loaded parking. Um, I'm sure if we reduce a significant amount of parking, um, I don't know if the, the six spots that you mentioned would really have much of an impact. Mm -hmm. um, it would obviously reduce just a little bit of, the, of that row of parking that's in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, so it would, it would reduce the impacts slightly. Um, right. But whether or not that you know meets the uh, Trinity's goal for parking as well as as Durham's uh, requirements. So, mm -hmm. okay, well, one more question, please, sir. Um, I, I noticed that we that it was necessary for us to put some fill um, in the in, in the flood fl flood fringe for the stormwater control mechanism uh, measure to the uh, to the south of Building Two. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so it, it, was that fill, is that fill necessary for the function of that measure or is that fill necessary uh, just to, to meet the city's freeboard requirements for structures in the, in the flood fringe? It, that feels necessary to, to just contain the water so we can, can release the on-site runoff uh, per the pre-existing conditions. Um, it's just more to, to dam up. It's not a freeboard issue there. It just mm. a casualty of putting a, a stormwater pond at the bottom of the site. I see. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for the witness? All righty then. Um, All right. If not, I'll excuse this witness and call our next witness, Mr. Earl Llewellyn. <clears throat> You could advance the next slide, please, as well. Mr. Llewellyn, could you please state your name and address for the board? 
Uh, good morning, Earl Llewellyn, traffic engineer with Kimley Horn, 300 Morris Street here in Durham. Can you please describe your background in education? Uh, sure, I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from NC State. I'm a registered professional engineer in North Carolina, 32 years of experience in the traffic engineering field, and I've worked with Kimley Horn for 12 years. And are you prepared to testify as to certain factors related to the permit today? Yes, I'll be testifying regarding traffic circulation, parking, loading, and service vehicle access. All right, and are those related to factors three of the general findings and related factors to um, UDO 3.9.8? That's correct. Okay, um, at this time, I'd like to tender Mr. Llewellyn as an expert in traffic engineering. I think I've seen he's received, so I'll, I'll proceed. Um, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Llewellyn, um, could, did you prepare any reports or analysis in connection with the site plan? I, I did. I prepared a traffic impact analysis that has since been reviewed and approved by NCDOT. Thank you. And can you please explain the traffic and circulation aspects of this plan? Sure. Uh, the only road adjacent to the site is TW Alexander Drive, which is the northern boundary of the site. Stuart Creek Drive is located to the west of the property, separated by the Power Secure Building, which is a commercial warehouse property. Um, the proposed plan accommodates anticipated traffic via two site driveways onto uh, TW Alexander Drive. Building one uh, access is the green arrow on the left side of the screen. Construction of an exclusive eastbound right turn lane uh, that's the area shown in orange there. Uh, that turn lane is proposed at the site drive. There's already an exclusive westbound left turn lane present. Access to buildings two and three is indicated by the green arrow on the right. Um, and both left and right turn lanes are present uh, on TW Alexander at that entrance. Uh, there's also a pending signal installation. Uh, at this intersection. Um, both site driveways have been designed to accommodate anticipated traffic demands and vehicles, including service vehicles, delivery and emergency vehicles, and adequate site distance is, uh, <clears throat> is provided at these intersections with GW Alexander. So uh, building one provides a total of 197 parking spaces that are located along the north and east sides of the building. Um, handicap and bicycle parking is provided in accordance with the UDO. Uh, similarly, buildings two and three have a total of 252 parking spaces located along the perimeter uh, with a truck court located between the buildings. Here again, uh, handicap and bicycle parking per UDO. Uh, sorry. Uh, both site driveways have been designed to accommodate service and emergency vehicles. Uh, circulation on the building 2-3 side offers a circular pattern for easy ingress and egress of service vehicles. Uh, and we've noted access to refuse areas located in blue for easy, easy access to those. Great, okay, thank you. And, and based on these factors and your experience, how will this use as designed impact public health or safety? Based on the traffic analysis and the layout and circulation aspects um, that I've covered, this use will not adversely impact the health or safety of uh, public. Thank you. And, and together with Mr. Smith, um, Kimley Horn oversaw the, the layout of the site, correct? That's correct. And took into account the parking needs um, of, of the user as well as the requirements at the UDO? That's right. Thank you. I have no further questions for this witness. Um, would the board have any questions? Any questions for Ms. Mr. Llewellyn? I don't think so, Jim. Go ahead. I think Mr. Meadows has his hand up, but I can't tell if that was a leftover. Okay. Last time. Okay. okay. Thank you. Just wanted to check. 
Uh, then I'll excuse Mr. Llewellyn and call our final witness, Mr. Martin. If you could advance to the next slide, please, while Mr. Martin is getting ready. Uh, Mr. Martin, could you please state your name and address for the board? Yes, Jarvis Martin. Uh, I have an office that is at 3604 Shannon Road here in Durham. And can you describe your background and experience, please? Yes, uh, I hold two degrees from North Carolina Central University in business. I'm a state certified general appraiser. I'm designated through the Appraisal Institute, the SRA designation. And I have over 45 years of experience here in the uh, research training area in terms of property valuation and uh, consultant services. Thank you, Mr. Martin. At this time, I'd like to tender Mr. Martin as an expert in appraisal and impacts of development on adjacent properties. All righty, works, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martin, what did you do for you uh, to prepare your testimony for today? Uh, I reviewed the site plan that's been in discussion uh, was on various uh, conference calls with the development team as different aspects uh, of the site was discussed. I had visited the site as well as uh, driven uh, the surrounding area and looked at the adjoining uh, properties. Thank you. And are you prepared to testify as to certain factors related to the permit? Yes, I'm prepared to testify that the development is in harmony uh, with the overall characteristics of the neighborhood, that the adjacent uh, properties based upon this proposed uh, infill uh, would not be adversely impacted in terms of their value and function, and that these factors are in compliance with the general findings uh, of factors 10 and 11, and in the standards uh, 2 and 4 of the limited use. Great. Could you explain um, your analysis uh, and, and for the board, please? Well, basically, uh, uh, I went out and took a look at the existing site, uh, drove around the uh, general area, looked at the factors that has already been presented, been presented in terms of the fact that this field will not have any uh, impact on the flow of a floodplain, uh, which would then have no adverse impact on any properties that is upstream from uh, the property. Uh, also that this development uh, is consistent with what exists out there today. Uh, it is nearby the existing RDU Amazon Fulfillment Center. There are other several commercial uh, warehouses in close proximity, as well as industrial and manufacturing uh, use all around this property. Great, thank you. As Mr. Smith testified earlier, uh, exterior lighting for the site would be screened by the floodway. Um, how does that influence your um, opinion of any impact on the residential uses to the north of TW Alexander? The townhouse development to the north based upon the buffering of the floodway as well as the natural uh, tree uh, buffering that exists at a day uh, will limit any uh, overflow of the lighting or glare, et cetera, and have no adverse impact on those residents. Thank you. Um, and based on your analysis and uh, site examination, um, is it your opinion that the use will be in harmony with the surrounding area? I do, yes, it is in harmony and uh, will fit in well with what exists out there today. Thank you. I have no further questions for this witness. Does the board have any? Any questions for Mr. Martin? I don't, I don't see any. All right, please continue. Thank you. At this time, I'd just like to confirm that um, the application and all materials in the agenda, as well as our PowerPoint, be admitted into evidence. All right, so noted. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to um, summarize the, the competent material and substantial evidence you've heard before you today. Um, if there are any uh, opponents that would like to speak in advance, I'm happy to. Uh, defer that summary to the end um, of, of any comments they'd like to make or give it now. All right, does the board have any questions for the applicant? All right, uh, Mr. Richels. Uh, yes, I'm not sure who this would go to. Um, this is just in respect to the health or safety of the public. Um, was the site plan approved? Um, would this infill to have any segmented walls? 
or any kind of uh, build up structure to support these um, retention or detention areas on the south end building too? Yes, um, I can jump in. Um, yes, there are a couple walls that are inside the floodplain to support the fill for the for the development, and they have uh, gone through uh, calculations to make sure that the walls can withstand the flood waters that are are washing up against them. Um, and they should be they're they're designed with with all due respect to the safety. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to chime in and state just the site plan is not yet approved, uh, depending upon the board's decision here today would be the final approval of the site plan. Thanks, Eliza. Uh, Mr. Kip? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I heard that um, the building or perhaps it's building two, maybe all three buildings are two feet above the elevations um, of the stream. I assume that's the, the hundred year high flood point. Um, but I guess my question is, do you have any concerns that if there was a 500 year flood that these buildings would be inundated? Cause I kind of do. The Durham requirements two feet above the, the base flood elevation, um, as mentioned earlier, we're six feet above. That was just the, the meeting the minimum criteria. Okay, so you're six feet above. So how much of a flood would have to happen to, to get to the UD? I, I mean, I don't know. The floodplains are getting worse. We all know this. Uh, so, so I guess in your professional opinion, Mr. Smith, six feet is sufficient to ward off any floods in the near and distant future? Uh, can I chime in real quick from a staff perspective? Um, so we cannot regulate past what the UDO requires. And I don't think the applicant has done any calculations past what the UDO requires. So we're looking at 100 year, no further than that. So we cannot regulate up to 500 year. Um, and I did want to just clarify that it's the base flood elevation in relation to the floodplain. There is no encroachments proposed within the riparian stream buffer. Um, so if Mr. Smith has anything additional to add, but we, do not have regulations within the Unified Development Ordinance for 500 year. That's not something that's within the code. So I don't know if that has even been prepared. And even so, I don't know um, how comfortable I feel with that testimony as we have not reviewed it, nor have any standards to um, put it up against. Okay. Um, so looking at building two west side where the fill is going, that's not in the riparian stream? No. Yeah. Where is the riparian screen? Um, I'm going to go, if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to flip through a little bit to back to that first slide. Actually, you might be able to see it here. Yes. Kind of. Well, yeah. So to the rear, um, this is the floodway. It's the floodway is what's running through earlier, um, which I'm going to go back to the original map because um, it shows it a little bit in simpler terms. Um, if my computer will allow me. Um, so the floodway that runs through and then there's the floodway fringe. So this little document here is the primary concerns that were the request is for today. The riparian stream buffer is located on site, the wetland area is located on site, um, as well as the floodway itself have no encroachments, nothing is going within them. We're just talking about things that are going within the floodplain fringe. There are no proposed encroachments within the riparian stream buffer. Okay. Uh, final question. This site was once owned by GE. Is that right? That's, uh, staff is not familiar with property records, but I, Jamie, I believe. Answered. That's my understanding. Um, and I'd invite Travis to, to correct me if he has a different understanding. That is correct. This was purchased directly from GE Aviation. Okay. Thank you. That's all. And I'd just like to clarify um, in the question, I appreciate um, Eliza clarifying it and I just want to make out a clear out of abundance of caution. It's not that there were requirements to do a 500 year study that we didn't fulfill. Those were not requirements. This went through multiple rounds of review with the staff uh, for many months um, beginning, uh, I think in January, the beginning of this year. Those um, included a certification study and a no rise impact that had been thoroughly vetted 
by the staff and reviewed to get us to this point here today. Um, so um, it's not a, it's not that we didn't do calculations that were required of us. We did, uh, I think, uh, what was required and, and maybe then some. Um, and I think that testimony that Mr. Smith gave just certifies that we've met and exceeded those requirements with respect to the finished floor elevation in order to accommodate a little bit more um, of that rise uh, if it would happen in the future. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, are there any uh, further questions for the applicant? If not, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to do a summary of our evidence now or if the board prefers to wait. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody registered to speak in opposition. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. If you want to okay. go ahead and do the summary, then we'll move on. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, just to summarize, we've uh, offered competent material and substantial evidence today on each of the factors that are before you for decision um, in the form of both of our exhibits and live testimony. And I'd like to summarize how that relates to each of the factors. With respect to the importance of the facility, Mr. Caldwell testified that this development is needed to accommodate the market growth of industrial demand in the area. Um, as this continues to grow in this industrial um, area. And there is a tenant that is signed up just to um, occupy this space. Um, and this is kind of our last uh, approval that we need in order to have the site plan approved and to have that move forward. Um, with respect to UDO compliance, Mr. Smith testified that the proposed use is consistent with the comprehensive plan policies and applicable tier guidelines and the purposes of this overall district that the use is also in conformance with all special requirements applicable to the use and has stated where those have not applied, that exterior lighting with respect to glare um, and traffic safety and impact have all been minimized um, with respect to additional buffers and meeting code requirements, that signs are appropriately located on the site and utilities and locations of yards all meet UDO requirements. Um, with respect to safety, um, welfare, and flood impact, Mr. Smith testified that the proposed use will not adversely impact the health or safety of the public, that the preservation of tree cover, um, floodplain, and stream buffers have been designed in a way to minimize impacts uh, while still protecting natural features um, and water quality. Um, he has also noted that it's not a waterfront location, that the expected heights, velocity, and duration um, of the floodwaters have all been studied and have been reviewed by staff uh, do not raise concerns based on his professional expert opinion. Um, with respect to traffic and circulation, Mr. Llewellyn offered his expert opinion that the site proposes an appropriate number and location of access points, that the appropriate review has taken place by both staff and NCDOT, and that certain improvements have been um, planned and designed in order to um, maximize safety and provide ingress and egress both for the routine vehicles and emergency vehicles that may need to access the site. And Mr. Martin offered his expert testimony based on many years of experience that the proposed use is in harmony with the area, not substantially injurious to the value of nearby properties in the general vicinity, and that the various site aspects and design that were covered today um, all tend to have minimal effects or minimize the effects of the use on nearby properties, and that the proposed use is compatible and in harmony with his overall industrial area. Under North Carolina law, uh, if you find that we've shown each of these findings with competent material and substantial evidence, uh, the law indicates the permit should be approved today and we hope that our, our testimony and answers to the questions lead you to that conclusion. I'm happy to answer any other questions at this time and of course throughout the remainder of the, of the hearing. All right, thank you. All right, uh, any, doesn't look like there's any further um, anyone else to speak in favor of this? Is there anyone here to speak against this application for a minor special use permit? Good morning, Alessandra here. We did have a Mimi Kessler register as an opponent. Um, and I do see that Mimi is here within the meeting. Mimi expressed in her registration that she just wanted to attend and does not intend upon speaking, but I don't know if that's changed based upon today's testimony. So um, yes, yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Um, all right. Any any uh, any further questions for the applicant before we get a staff's recommendation? All right, Eliza, do you have a recommendation for the board? Yes, I do. Apologies, I was muted there for a moment. Um, staff recommends approval of the minor special use permit case number B two one zero 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 one one with the condition that the improvement shall be substantially consistent of, with the information submitted to the board as a part of the application and site plan case number D two one zero 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 nine. 
All right. Thank you, Eliza. All right. Any board discussion? Thoughts? All right, well, without hearing anybody, it doesn't look, sound like anybody's got any objections or concerns. Does anybody want to offer a motion? Um, I hereby make a motion that application number B2000011, an application for the minor special use permit allowed fill in the floodway fringe, non encroachment area fringe future conditions, flood hazard area, or areas of shallow flooding from the property located at 1730 TW Alexander Drive has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. The improvement shall be substantially consistent with the information submitted to the board as a part of the application and site plan case B is in David 2100009. All right, we've got a motion for approval by Ms. Jeter. Is there a second? Retchless second. All right, we've got a second by Mr. Retchless. Uh, Jessica, will you call the board? I will, although I warn you, there is a train coming behind me. It may get noisy. I apologize. Um, to begin, Rogers? Yes. Kip? Yes. Meadows? No. No? No. Thank you. Uh, Retchless? Yes. Wymore? Yes. Jeter? Yes. And Boucher? Yes. Motion carries six to one. By a vote of six to one, your minor special uh, request for a minor special use permit has been uh, granted. We appreciate you coming for the BOA this morning and wish you the best of luck. Thank you all very much. All right. Um, let's moving on to the next case. Uh, Jessica, you want to call it? Yes, sir. B2100025 is a city case. A request for a minor special use permit to Permit an alternative street design. The subject site is located at 601 Willard Street, is zoned Downtown Design Core, or DDC, and in the downtown tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time, and property owners within 600 feet and neighborhood organizations have been notified. Notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. The seating for this case will be Rogers, Meadows, Kip, Retchless, Wymore, Jeter, and Boucher. All right. Um, before we hear from staff, let's uh, um, uh, swear in everyone. Sorry, my mind went blank. So if you do plan on giving testimony on this one, if you'll please turn your camera on. I'm just looking around here. Uh, is Mimi Kessler still on this one or do we need to? There's a little bit of a lag with moving okay. everybody over. Um, Ashton's the same way. He's not on this one either. So so um, we got, let's look, I've got three. So if, if you'll raise your right hand to do the oath, uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I'm looking at Earl Llewellyn. Yes. Patrick Riker. Yes, sir. Christina Whitfield. Yes. Tim Somerville. Yes. Garvis Martin. Yes. Also, do you uh, consent to this remote meeting platform, Jarvis? Yes. Tim. Yes. Christina? Yes. Patrick? Yes. Earl? Yes. All righty. Thank you. Uh, Liza, this one yours? Yes, it is. Um... Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Liza Monroe here representing the planning department. Planning staff requests that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted, thank you. Thank you. 
Case B210025 is a request for a minor special use permit to allow for an alternative street design. The applicant is Stewart and the subject site is located at 601 Willard Street. The case area is highlighted in red on the screen. The site is zoned Downtown Design Core or DDC and is located in the downtown development tier. The subject site um, currently has several vacant buildings um, in terms of there's not a tenant in those spaces and parking lots that will be demolished and restriped as needed for the proposed mixed use development. Um, first section 16.4.3A.2H of the Unified Development Ordinance. Alternatives to the street design requirements of UDO section 16.4 can be approved with a minor special use permit pursuant to UDO section 3.9. In addition to the general review required findings, the board shall also find that the alternative design meets or exceeds the multimodal performance and functionality of the street design standards within that section. Strict application of the ordinance would require that the street design emulates the standards mentioned in UDO section 16.43.4.3a.2e. The code requires that the street should be designed utilizing the primary street type, which requires a two lane street with on street parking and bicycle lanes. The total width of the primary street type is a minimum of 56 feet, including a travel lane a bicycle parking lane, a parking lane, a bicycle parking buffer, um, and a, a curb and gutter section. The applicant is requesting an alternative street design that excludes that bicycle lane, as well as the parking structure, as um, they noted in their application that the streets will be internal to an overall mixed use development where pedestrian traffic will be encouraged more um, as there will be a parking lots or parking facilities adjacent to this development. We have not had very many of these cases, um, so I will definitely be able to dissect this if you would like. Um, I believe this is our first case in this nature. So definitely, as I mentioned in the last one, please feel free to ask any questions or if you need something clarified, please feel free to do so. Um, UDO section 3.9.A B, A and B establishes four findings and review factors that the applicant must meet in order for the board to grant a use permit. These findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the finding and review factors are identified in the application, both of which are within your packet and staff will be available for any questions as needed during the hearing process. Thank you, Eliza. I'm just looking through here. Do we have any questions? I think Jeff? Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Eliza, you read my mind. Um, you're channeling. Um, my question to you was, have we had any developments like this um, or similar to this um, in this area or, or around downtown? I, I don't remember seeing anything like this before, but maybe it wouldn't have come to us. So I'm just curious, has, is, is this happening around the city or is this kind of the, one of the uh, pioneering efforts? This is going to be the first case that's like this, that's requesting this type of street design. Um, even uh, with, with regards to your question, if it would have been you all, prior to the current minor special use permit, we had design special use permits, um, and those were also related to the design district. There has not been a similar case to this. Uh, so this is essentially the prototype, even though there is no precedent established with you all's decision today, every applicant would be required to have their burden of proof. But yes, this is the first case of this nature with this specific street type being requested. Yes, hence the please ask any questions you would like. We want to make sure that the board has enough information, <clears throat> excuse me, to make an informed decision um, based upon the evidence presented. Uh, any other questions for Eliza? All right, cool. Uh, would the applicant might like come forward Mr. Bikers, are you taking the lead on this one? Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, I'm Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. Our office address is 112 West Main Street here in Durham. We represent Capital Broadcasting, the developer of the award-winning American Tobacco Campus in downtown Durham. The site we are discussing with the board today is the former University Ford car dealership. It is impossible to overstate the catalytic impact that the American Tobacco Campus has had on downtown Durham. American Tobacco has spearheaded the transformation of our moribund downtown that I personally recall from 25 years ago. 
Pardon me, I have a siren in our lively downtown going by right now. American tobacco is perhaps the finest historic redevelopment in all of North Carolina. It has stimulated the growth of the dynamic downtown that we've enjoyed for the past decade or so, the COVID pandemic notwithstanding. I trust that each member of the board is familiar with this background information. We are here this morning to request a minor special use permit as permitted in UDO section 16.4.3 A2H for an alternative form of compliance for the new streets in the next phase of American Tobacco. We envision that these streets will be private when they are built within the 11 acres that formerly was University Ford. At the outset, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask that exhibits A through E that we have submitted to ELIZA that uh, these be admitted into evidence. These will be relied upon or referred to by our experts. And we ask that that along with the staff report be moved into evidence. Exhibits A through D are the resumes of our expert witnesses in order to make this uh, agenda item move more efficiently. I am in advance requesting that all of them be accepted as experts and we are tendering them as experts in the field of site engineering and traffic engineering and property appraisal. Exhibit E is an impact analysis performed by Jarvis Martin, our real estate appraiser. I'd like to briefly go over our requested plan and the forecast of evidence. Section 16.4.3 A2H of the UDO allows for alternative forms of compliance in order to deviate from the primary street type shown in UDO section 16.4.3 E1. Section 3.91B of the UDO gives the Board of Adjustment final decision-making authority over all special use permit applications. This proceeding therefore will be somewhat out of the ordinary and it is, I understand the first one of its type. Since we are not discussing any particular uses within American tobacco, rather we are presenting competent material and substantial evidence on the record that the alternative form of compliance meets or exceeds the multimodal performance and functionality of the primary street type. Our team working on the redevelopment of University Ford as the next phase of the American Tobacco Campus will demonstrate that the alternative form of compliance meets all the requirements for approval set forth in the UDO through the exhibits and the testimony. Our following witnesses, again, are all experts in his or her field. Our first witness is Mr. Tim Somerville. He's our engineer and site designer from Stewart Engineering here in downtown Durham. Our second witness will be Mr. Earl Llewellyn, an experienced traffic engineer from Kimley Horn. Uh, he's a former traffic engineer with the city of Durham. Our third witness is Ms. Christina Whitfield. She also is an experienced traffic engineer who, with Kimley Horn, who specializes in bike and pedestrian design standards. And last, will be Mr. Jarvis Martin, a real estate appraiser here in Durham with many years of experience. Again, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, in order to streamline our presentation, since I know you have a long agenda, we are tendering each of those as witnesses. So once I call them as witnesses, uh, they'll be able to proceed through their testimony. And then we respectfully ask that the board hold their questions until each witness has finished with his or her testimony on their required findings of the UDO. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to conclude my introduction, uh, as you consider the evidence, please keep in mind the legal standards which govern a hearing of this type. It is our burden as the applicant to provide competent material and substantial evidence showing that each of the required approval standards has been met. Once this is done, the applicant is entitled to issuance of the special, of the special use permit as a matter of state law. Again, this particular request is a little unusual. Actually, it's quite unusual in that the request is not for a specific use, but it is about an alternative street cross section. Accordingly, our discussion will focus on why our team's proposed design meets or exceeds the multimodal performance and functionality of the primary street type shown in UDO section 16.4.3 E1. Please keep in mind, the fact that the UDO allows this board to consider and approve alternative forms of compliance demonstrates that the primary street type may not be the right cross section for every development. We feel confident that the material, competent and substantial evidence that will be submitted to you today will establish clearly that the applicant has completed, complied with all the requirements of the UDO and therefore this permit should be approved. 
Unless there are any questions for me, I would like to call our first witness, Mr. Tim Somerville. And I understand Eliza has a, a PowerPoint that uh, Tim sent in uh, in advance of this hearing. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Mr. Biker before we hear from the witnesses? Um, no, Chad, you don't? All right. Uh, I, I have one question that I would like to, for Mr. Biker or any of the witnesses to, to, to address as, as they go forward, and that is um, the notion that these are going to be private streets and whether or not that is something that the city has discretion in terms of granting. Uh, I just wanted to understand that a little bit more. Um, and however that's worked into the presentation is just fine with me. Yeah, well, how about if we just hold that for the, uh, the end? Uh, it, because that, with all due respect, we're happy to answer that question at the end of our presentation. That's actually not a finding required under UDO section 3.9. Mm -hmm. Happy to discuss it, but please let us hold that till the end. Uh, we'd like to get in all our, our evidence on the required findings. Uh, whether or not the streets are public or private is, is really not relevant to this hearing today. Although again, we'll, we'll be happy to discuss it at the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, whoever again, our first witness will be Mr. Tim Somerville. Yep. Thank you, Patrick and good morning board members. Um, I am Tim Somerville of Stewart. My address is 101 West Main Street here in Durham. Um, as Patrick mentioned, Exhibit A in your package lists all my qualifications, which I'd like to go through briefly here. I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Michigan State University. I've been working in the field of civil engineering for the last 17 years with a focus on site design and land development projects. I've been a North Carolina registered professional engineer for the past 11 years, and I've been with Stewart for the past 10 years and currently serve as director of civil engineering in our Durham office. In regards to this application, I served as a site engineer and designer, and I'm here to discuss the overall design of the project. The planning for the redevelopment of this University Ford as the expansion of the existing award-winning American Tobacco Campus began about four years ago, and the site plan has evolved um, to what you see before you over the, the last 12 months. Um, the plan you see before you currently is the infrastructure-only site plan, which shows the proposed road network proposed road section, the alternate that we're requesting today, and the building pads. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. The full build out of the site is for phase one of the project development, which consists of a combined residential and retail building, two office buildings with the retail on the ground floor, and a parking garage also with ground floor retail. The residential building also contains an internal parking garage. The emphasis of this development is to be a destination, um, a place to live and work or come visit, you know, the many site amenities that will be provided before going to a show or ball game at the adjacent DPAC or Durham Bulls Athletic Park. The site design was intentional to encourage vehicles to park in the surrounding parking decks and to provide a pedestrian friendly environment. There are a few items on the site plan I would like to note that were intentional to accomplish this environment. The orange items you see on the plan are raised pedestrian crossings. These crossings will be at the grade of the sidewalk in lieu of using traditional sidewalk ramps to aid in pedestrian crossing while also minimizing the speeds of vehicular or bicycle traffic in the streets. The longest straight segment between a raised crossing curb or intersection is 250 feet to minimize speeds. Curves are designed with a maximum centerline radius of 100 feet, which is the AASHTO standard for a 20 mile an hour speed limit. Also, you notice on the site plan some green areas, which are proposed bicycle parking facilities. The green areas shown within the parking garages are for general public use and are there a total of 72 covered and protected bicycle parking spaces within these areas. There are also an additional 62 bicycle parking spaces located throughout the site for use by the general public. Additionally, there are 162 internal spaces provided that will be exclusive to the office and residential users of the site. With this information, I want to re reiterate that the overall intent for this section of the American Tobacco Campus is to be a destination development and not a drive or ride through development. Residents and visitors will be encouraged to park their cars or their bicycles and walk to the various amenities provided on site and throughout the surrounding area. The primary street type that is required is a 60 foot wide cross section with wider drive lanes and protected bicycle lanes on both sides. 
this section is not conducted conducive to the type of development that is being proposed as the wider section will encourage faster speeds, encourage more traffic of bicycles to utilize the streets that will conflict with pedestrians and longer crossing times for, times for the pedestrians at the intersection. It is my professional opinion that a 56 wide foot wide cross section as required by the primary street type would, would encourage faster speeds, more conflicts than what our team has proposed as the alternate form of compliance that is before the board today. Um, there are several review factors that, are, that were addressed in our application. I would like to go through them quickly here. Um, you know, lighting, generally speaking, this review factor is not impacted by the request for an alternative form of compliance for residential streets. Lighting will meet all UDO standards. Signs, again, this factor is not impacted by the request for an alternative form of compliance for internal streets, but all new signs will meet UDO standards. Utilities, the request for an alternative form of compliance for internal streets does not affect the utilities serving the site. Open space, the request for an alternative form of compliance for internal streets does not affect the amount of open space required. Environmental protection, there are no environmental features on this site since it is a former car dealership. Screening, buffering, and landscaping. Landscaping will meet all UDO standards at a minimum. I hope the track record of the existing American Tobacco Campus speaks for itself on review factors such as this. Effects on nearby properties. In my expert opinion, the request for an alternative form of compliance for internal streets will not result in any noticeable increase in noise, odor, lighting at the site as a result of granting this special use permit. Compatibility. Again, the request for alternative form of compliance for internal streets is appropriate in this location because it is my professional opinion that the request for an alternative form of compliance for internal streets is consistent and compatible with the nearby properties. Consistency with policy. Besides what is stated on page six of the staff report, the only policy our team could identify that relates to this special use permit application is the Durham Beltline Master Plan that the city adopted in 2018. Just so happens that Stewart Engineering was the lead consultant on the creation of the Beltline Master Plan. The Master Plan was developed over several years with multiple public meetings and inputs. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? This is an expert excerpt of the, of the Durham Beltline Master Plan, and it shows the trail to continue, the connection of the trail from the Beltline to the American Tobacco Trail to continue down Pettigrew to Blackwell Street, and then connect to the existing American Tobacco Trail. There is no indication in the Beltline Master Plan that bike lanes should go through the University Ford site. Alternatively to the Blackwell Street connection, there are bike lanes proposed to be striped on Willer Street, which connects to an existing bike lane on, the Ch on Chapel Hill Street. This work is proposed currently by, by the city of Durham. Accordingly, the alternative form of compliance is consistent with the regulations within the UDO and all of other adopted plans pertinent to this site. In my professional opinion, the alternative form of compliance is compatible with nearby properties and the site has been designed in a manner to minimize adverse effects in the nearby properties. Finally, it is my prof professional opinion that the alternative form of compliance for the internal street within the next phase of American Tobacco has been designed in compliance with all adopted policies applicable to the site. Um, I'm Happy to answer any questions at this time, or else I would like to invite uh, Earl Llewellyn to speak on behalf of the tra traffic. All right, any questions for Mr. Somerville? Um, Chad, I saw your hand first. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Somerville. I appreciate your work on, uh, on transportation throughout the city. I, I had two quick questions. One is, did, was it necessary for your plan or how did, did you address transitions between existing streets that are adjacent to the site um, and perhaps it's if you could or someone else talk a little bit more about the sidewalk configuration within the site uh, whether now or at some other appropriate time um, I can answer both of those so the current site plan I don't know Liza if you could go back to this previous slide um, Yeah, we're showing connections right now. We have three proposed connections to the, actually two proposed connections to the existing street. We have one on Willard on the left side of the page there, and then one to the north on Jackson Streets. Um, those are be brand new connection to existing streets. The connection to the bottom, the very bottom of the sheet is an existing connection, which is 
what was formerly car, called Car Street, but that is an existing street connection. You know, those will just be standard standard uh, intersections with with curb radiuses and uh, you know sidewalk crossings. The internal sidewalk network to the site um, is you know the UDO requires a 12 to 18 foot sidewalk from back of curb to face of building, and our our sidewalk varies anywhere between that um, the width throughout throughout the project, whether it's you know 12. 12 or 18 feet. We also have several internal sidewalks in our open space um, to connect all of the, the different buildings, uh, retail spaces, and open space amenities. So, I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. All right, um, Natalie? Um, how many non-residential parking spaces did you say? Bicycle parking spaces? No, non-residential. You said you had. Oh, uh, um, so there are there are a total of 162 spaces provided that will be exclusive to the office and residential users. I don't have that breakdown on me currently, but I could get it for you if you want the exact number of um, residential spaces. The UDO requires. Um, 0.5 bicycle spaces per residential unit. And I believe we're right about at that number for in the residential building. And just for clarification, the residential building is that big square one on the left. And they'll, they'll have the residential spaces located in there. And then the office spaces will be in the parking deck, which is a large building at the top of the development. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Kip. Thank you. So my understanding is there are no bikes allowed in this site, is that right? No, that is not. Um, we're, we're encouraging it to be a multimodal um, street. You know, bikes, pedestrians, vehicles can trans, you know, drive through these sites as needed, but you know, where it's encouraged to park your vehicles, um, you know, within, within the bike racks or parking spaces provided, but no, no form of transportation will be prohibited through the site. Okay, but there's there your street plan does not include dedicated bike lanes, correct? That is correct. Yes. Okay, so where will the bikes ride? The bikes will ride within with the street with you know, with all the other traffic, the multimodal that will share share the use with the vehicles. Okay. Um, did you consider? And you probably can't answer this or don't want to answer this. Did you consider just having? like in the award-winning downtown of Madison, Wisconsin, State Street, uh, buses and bikes only, no cars? Was that considered? No. A, a pedestrian, a pedestrian only area. Yeah, that, that wasn't specifically considered. Um, it was always intended to, to allow all forms of transportation to get through the site. But again, you know, limiting, discouraging by providing narrower lanes, tighter curves, the, the, the speed humps to, to prohibit, you know, if an Uber needs to come in here to pick someone up or, you know, a Grubhub to pick up food from one of the retails or, you know, drop people off, you know, that's welcome to come through, but not have everyday traffic driving through here as a, as a cut through or a um, you know, way from get to point A to point B. Again, it's a destination development. I just one more question for you. Um, who's going to maintain, who's going to enforce Will will the parking uh, the, will the meter maids be here um, and the police riding around or will this be private security? They will. It will all be provided by the American Tobacco Developers Capital Broadcasting. Um, there are no public. There are no meters on here. Um, you know, I, I don't know if the long term, short term parking within the uh, in the spaces, but there will be no public enforcement. Okay, another question. Will this be open 24 hours to the public or will it be gated and exclusive? It will not be gated. Um, there, there may be times where it, they want to close off a certain section of the street to have a street festival, but it will be accessible 24 hours most of the time. You know, a lot of the businesses that are in there are not going to be open 24 hours. So, Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Rexless, did you have something? I think I'm going to uh, wait to the end um, to, to bring my questions uh, to the applicants. Okay. Uh, all right, I think that's uh, all we have.
for Mr. Somerville. Uh, Mr. Biker. Our next witness is Mr. Earl Llewellyn. He'll go over his qualifications and experience and then uh, address uh, specific findings in the UDO relating to this special use permit application. Thank you. Good morning again, Earl Llewellyn, traffic engineer with Kimley Horn. Uh, I think it's exhibit B, lists my qualifications, but to summarize, I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from NC State, registered professional in North Carolina, professional engineer in North Carolina, 32 years of experience in the transportation engineering field, 11 of which was with the city of Durham Transportation Department. And for the last 12 years, I've been with Kimley Horn. Uh, I was brought in to investigate the design components of the primary and proposed street cross sections and how they would relate to the site. Um, Eliza, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So in addition, in addition to the two travel lanes and parking lanes, the UDO primary cross section also requires five foot bike, bike lanes and three and a half foot bike parking buffers on both sides of the street. So that increases the total street width by 17 feet. This increase in cross section uh, or cone of vision for automobile drivers tends to encourage higher speeds. Simply put, the farther that you can see, the faster you tend to drive. Uh, next slide, please. So in, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, in reviewing the site plan and the proposed street design cross section, uh, as Tim said, this is designed to be a low speed pedestrian oriented destination. And from the layout, you can see that it's not a through street. Um, the addition of the proposed narrow cross section, as well as vertical and horizontal elements that uh, Tim alluded to, these are raised pedestrian crosswalks, raised intersections, and you can see there's many of those, but, but in addition, there's horizontal aspects like the tight radii uh, of the curves. Those together tend to enforce a uh, target speed, if you will, of about 15 to 17 miles per hour. At these low speeds, bicycles and automobiles can easily share a mixed use lane without conflict. Also being located in the shared use lane, cyclists are uh, more visible to the automobile traffic that may be making parking maneuvers or turning into the driveways or street connections. And now I'll address the UDO transportation related review factors. Um, as to circulation, as designed, the site provides for safe and efficient circulation of cars, bicycles, bicycles, service and emergency vehicles. And as Tim discussed, a robust sidewalk system. There's also adequate space on site to accommodate parking and loading operations and bike parking will be provided in accordance with the UDO standards. Also, the proposed alternate form of compliance uh, for this internal street does not affect the entrance or service areas and have been designed to accommodate the anticipated service vehicles. In conclusion, it's my professional opinion that the alternative street plan for the proposed next phase of American Tobacco Campus is in harmony with the area and that it meets the requirements applicable to the special use permit. It's also my professional opinion that the site has been designed in an appropriate manner to safely accommodate automobile traffic, including emergency vehicles. I, I will note that in reviewing the staff report, I recognize the statement on page six that I believe is incorrect. It states, the applicant has proposed an alternative street design that does not provide safe bicycle transportation through the site as there are no bicycle lines proposed interior to the site. Now, certainly while separate bicycle lanes are not being proposed, I would disagree that this site doesn't provide safe bicycle transportation throughout the site. In fact, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, 
it's my professional opinion that the proposed street cross section provides equal or greater safety bicycle accommodations in this context. In addition, this new development will not as adversely affect health or safety of the public and this ad application adequately addresses all the review factors identified in the UDO and that the alternative design exceeds the multimodal performance and functionality of the street design standards in Article 16 of the UDO. Happy to address any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. Llewellyn, Chad? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Earl. One question, if you could talk a little bit about transit. Are there, are, are there transit facilities or uh, allowances or, or anything like that? How have you guys uh, worked that element into uh, the, the, the configuration? I think, and I can try to answer this in conjunction with perhaps Tim, but I think the, the correct statement is that transit would be most appropriately to serve this site in the future using, for example, Willard Street that actually has connectivity with the remainder of the street network as opposed to going internally. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that, um, Earl, you're, at, you're correct that um, there was a request by um, Triangle Transit to provide a bus stop on Willard um, as part of our site plan. Also, the Durham Transportation Center is located directly north of this site. Um, so there's your, your transit hub right there that can serve, serve the site and beyond. Could, could I, so will you be including a transit, uh, a stop on, on Willard? Is that part of, of your proposal? That is, that will be part of the proposal as requested by um, Triangle Transit. Thank you. All right, any other questions for, oh, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Retchless. Hi, um, Mr. Llewellyn, you mentioned um, the crosswalks are raised. Is that kind of like a speed bump type of set? Uh, I would say it is uh, better than a speed bump, to be honest with you. Um, speed bumps uh, tend to be oriented uh, with a pretty extreme vertical deflection, and they're separated too far to be effective. These are raised pedestrian crosswalks that are less dramatic but spaced out such that you maintain a more consistent speed throughout. You'll notice you, you start out with connections to the adjacent street system and they are spaced, um, I don't know the exact dimensions, a couple hundred feet apart so that you don't incur that deflection and slow down only to speed up again. So you, you see the vertical and horizontal elements of this playing together to reduce the speed also with a narrowed cross section that reduces the cone of vision, also encouraging slower speeds. Thank you. And in your professional opinion, does that hinder emergency vehicles as well to response time? No, not at all. In fact, that's one of the benefits of this type of design. We, I've worked actually when I was with the city of Durham, um, lots of emergency response folks do not like speed bumps they are pleased with speed humps, raised pedestrian tables, because they can navigate those um, at a reasonable speed uh, without having to slow down to two miles an hour. Very good, thank you. All right, any other questions for Mr. Luella? All right. Mr. Chairman, our next witness will be Ms. Christina Whitfield. Again, we are also tendering her as an expert witness in the field of transportation engineering. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Biker. Um, members of the board, my name is Christina Whitfield and my office address is 421 Fayetteville Street, Suite 600, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, as Mr. Biker mentioned earlier, my resume and qualifications are listed in Exhibit C of your packet, which I will review briefly for the members of our board. I have been with Kimley Horn and Associates for a little over five years. I hold a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering with a specialty of transportation from the University of Tennessee. I am both a licensed professional engineer here in the state of North Carolina and a certified planner through the American Institute of Certified Planners with APA. 
I am a project manager at Kimley Horn, focusing on the planning of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, including bicycle and pedestrian master plans, greenway plans, and complete street implementation projects, both here in North Carolina and across the Southeast. I was brought in today to evaluate the alternative form of compliance and how it promotes bicyclist safety. The internal site street, as you guys have heard from Mr. Llewellyn and Mr. Somerville earlier, is designed to ensure slow vehicular speeds, and as such, bikes and cars will be traveling at similar speeds. In my professional opinion, this is further reinforced by the addition of the raised crosswalks, the raised intersections, and the pinch points at intersections to limit the motor vehicle speeds throughout the site to less than 20 miles per hour. These speed management devices have also been proven to discourage through vehicular travel and are encouraged for implementation as, you know, the next steps above and beyond by NACTO, which is a very well-recognized um, bicycle design guide. These, um, these reduced speeds not only improve the bicycle environment by reducing overtaking events, that wider cross-section will allow cars to more easily overtake bicyclists, um, if there's, you know, crossing over to get into one of the driveways or be able to park their, their bikes. And then they also um, enhance the driver's ability to see and react to their surroundings due to those slower speeds and the design nature of the cross section. As Mr. Llewellyn shared with you earlier, the alternative street type is as safe or safer than the primary street type as the bicyclists remain more visible and that narrower street section and speed control devices encourage slower travel speed and more predictable movements across the intersections and driveways internal to the site. Additionally, the University Ford redevelopment is intended to be a pedestrian oriented destination where visitors arrive and park their cars or their bicycles at the periphery of the site and travel and visit the various amenities and retail destinations on foot. Finally, per the adopted plans for the bike facilities in Durham, connections to the Durham Beltline Trail from the American Tobacco Trail are intended to occur along Blackwell Street and new northbound bike lanes are being striped along Willard Street as part of an upcoming restriping and water project. With that, it is my professional opinion that the alternative design meets or exceeds the multimodal performance and functionality of the primary street type in UDO section 16.4.3 E1. And additionally, it is also my professional opinion that the applicant's proposed alternative is safer than the primary street type for the context that it is within. The primary street type, which is 56 feet wide, would lead to higher car speeds than what the applicant has proposed. Therefore, along with Mr. Llewellyn, I too respectfully disagree with the sentence on page six of the staff report, which says that the applicant has proposed an alternative street design that does not provide for safe bicycle transportation throughout the site, as there are no bicycle lanes proposed interior to the site. In my professional opinion, that statement is incorrect. I am available to answer any questions you all may have, and if not, I will turn it back over to Mr. Biker. All right, any questions for Ms. Whitfield? Uh, Mr. Retchless. Hi, Ms. Whitfield. Um, what kind of formula or study is done when you bring pedestrians and bicyclists in cars to closer proximities rather than allow for um, these separate lanes for bicycles and whatnot? It just, when I hear pinch point, I, I, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, people are going to get pinched or, or, you know, get in too tight of proximity. Um, is there some kind of formula or uh, a way you, you work through that? There is not a formula, but there is a lot of research and design guidance out there through the various means that actually point to those pinch points being proactive for bicyclist safety as they are exactly what slows down the motor vehicle traffic. Um, by what Mr. Llewellyn shared with us earlier, that narrower cone of vision and the safety that's included by those narrower sections allows the bikes and the cars to be in a similar um, portion in the lane so that there's full visibility throughout and there's no um, awkward interactions of a bicyclist having to cross the buffer plus the parking lane plus the intersection to make a turning movement. They're a little bit more visible because they're right there in the car's cone of vision instead of off to the side. Um. Mr. Llewellyn stated that raised crosswalks do slow down traffic and help emergency vehicles. Wouldn't it be the, uh, the same result if these crosswalks were raised with a bicycle path? I would um, have to yield to uh, Mr. Llewellyn or Mr. Somerville on the design aspects of how the bike lane would fit in with the raised cross sections. I'm not sure if there would have to be a, a section for that is recessed or if it would still go over. Yeah, I, you're, you're correct that the raised 
uh, the raised crosswalks would have the same effect if there was a dedicated bike lane. However, now we're talking about a 56 foot wide crossing that a pedestrian would have to make from curb to curb and have to watch out for you know, bicycles that are coming through the bike lane, uh, navigate through parking spaces, across the, the double drive lane, and then back through another set of parking spaces and protected bike lanes. So that, you know, that longer crossing time, you know, puts the pedestrian in harm's way for a, a longer duration. If I could also add, I think one of the biggest uh, concerns with a separated facility is the fact that under our proposed cross section, the cyclist will be in the middle of the lane, just like a vehicle would be very visible if they're making left or right turns or accessing mm -hmm. exiting street to access the parking, uh, the bicycle parking fields. Whereas if they're in a separate lane and they need to turn left into a particular establishment or parking area, they have to cross the bike uh, pedestrian, or excuse me, the bike parking buffer, the actual uh, parking lane, then cross into the vision of the traffic to make a left turn lane. That's, that gets to the number of increased conflicts and the unpredictability of where those interactions are gonna occur. That's why in my opinion, strongly in my opinion, in this particular case, that the inclusion of cyclists in the travel lane is much safer. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I appreciate the depth of experience that's here. It's obvious there's a lot of very um, you know, experienced professionals. Um, could somebody just explain quickly, are these streets that you're anticipating or these, these travel ways, are they similar in nature to Blackwell or Vivian or, or you know, some of the other roadways that are around uh, the tobacco campus immediately next door? Are, I, I mean, should, should we be expecting something similar to that functionality um, or, um, or different? Um, I, I think they would be a little different in, in the fact that Blackwell and Willard Street are, are through connections city, you know, they connect, you know, through the city, obviously the, these streets connect through the development, but there's really no reason to drive through this development. If you're trying to get from one end to the other, again, this is, you know, the development is designed as a des as, as the destination, not a cut through, you know, the Willard street, you, you travel on Willard, you're traveling on Blackwell to try to get from one end of town to the other. You know, if, if you're traveling through these, these internal streets that we're proposing here, um, you know, you're you're coming to visit the development. So I think it would it would function similarly, but the traffic count would be much less. So are these more like like driveways, like the the little through the piece that goes through near a loft and uh, and Mo's? Um, you know, that's that. Yes, like I, I would. I would I would say yes. They they would be more like a a driveway type of facility rather than a actual street. But by definition of UDL, we have to call them streets. Thank you. All right, any further questions? Mr. Biker, we'll turn it back over to you. Our last witness is Mr. Jarvis Martin, our team's real estate appraiser. Uh, good morning again to the chair and to the board. Uh, as indicated, my complete resume is shown in Exhibit uh, E. Uh, but in brief summary, again, I hold two degrees from North Carolina Central University, <clears throat> a state certified general appraiser, as well as a designation from the Appraisal Institute, SRA, uh, principal with the firm of Stuart Martin and McCoy, <clears throat> excuse me, and have over 45 years of experience. Uh, the applicant asked me to uh, get involved and take a look at the alternative street design to see if the lack of bike lanes would have an adverse impact on the surrounding properties in terms of their value or functionality. I have reviewed the site plan that has been presented. I have visited the site uh, as well as toured the surrounding uh, properties. And looking at <clears throat> trying to gauge if there would be an adverse impact on surrounding properties in terms of their lack of a bike lane through uh, this uh, development. I found three existing apartment complexes here in Durham 
that are on streets that have no bike lanes and found three complexes that are on streets that have direct access to bike lanes. Looking at the occupancy rate and the average rent per square foot of these units, my analysis so shows no adverse impact between the two groups in terms of access to bike lanes and no access to uh, bike lanes. Also <clears throat> um, in the analysis where there are no bike lanes, uh, one of the complexes exists adjacent to the proposed uh, complex uh, as we stand. Uh, based upon uh, that analysis uh, in terms of the rents, uh, it is my professional opinion uh, that the proposed development is in harmony with the overall uh, neighborhood. The lack of bike lanes through this development will not have any adverse impact on the surrounding uh, properties in terms of value and demand. That the impact analysis demonstrated that the proposed alternative street design uh, would have no adverse uh, impact on values or functionality of the properties in the uh, vicinity. And that it is my uh, professional opinion that the alternative compliance here in terms of internal street, streets would be in harmony with the area and have no substantial uh, injurious impact on property values or um, demand. So therefore I recommend that the approval of this special use permit uh, be granted for the construction of this development. And I'm open for any questions. Any questions for Mr. Martin? All right, turning back over to you, Mr. Biker. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, is there anybody signed up in opposition of this special use permit? Uh, if there is, I'd prefer to have that, uh, uh, those witnesses uh, present their evidence uh, prior to our summary. Uh, Liza Monroe here, Planning Department staff. There is no one signed up in opposition to speak for this case. Just goes to show clean living pays off. Um, but anyway, uh, for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Patrick Biker, again, attorney for the applicant team. Uh, at this time, I'd like to move into evidence all the exhibits that were relied upon by our witnesses uh, and that the uh, board reviewed in their consideration of this application. Uh, as uh, was mentioned at the beginning of this hearing, it's our burden to provide competent, substantial and material evidence on the record, showing that the proposal meets all of the UDO standards for approval of this special use permit. Again, this is a rather unique uh, proceeding this morning, uh, since we're not talking about a specific use or an increase in height or something of that nature. We're talking about an alternative street design, and you've heard abundant expert witness testimony from Mr. Somerville, Mr. Llewellyn, and Ms. Whitfield that the applicant's proposal meets or exceeds the UDO standard for the primary street type. Um, again, uh, since there's no contrary evidence in the record uh, and all the findings have been met, uh, we uh, put forward that state law directs the issuance of this permit. Uh, we're certainly happy to answer any questions. I recall, uh, I believe it was Mr. Meadows had a question about uh, the nature of the private streets uh, within the old University Ford site. Um, and we'll be happy to address that. If there are any other questions on the merits of the application, uh, we'd like to take those now and then address Mr. Meadows' question. Uh, and again, we respectfully ask for your approval and we very much appreciate all your time this morning. Thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you, Mr. Biden. <laughs> Excuse me, are there any questions for the uh, applicant or any of the witnesses? All right, Eliza, would you... Uh, Stop sharing for a moment. Thank you. Um, I guess there are no questions for you directly, Mr. Biker. Do you want to address the? the... Yeah, I guess uh, the, in terms of the private streets, my my take on that is that uh, um, American Tobacco has set a very very high bar in terms of aesthetics um, and functionality of the existing American Tobacco Campus, which again was the catalyst, one of the catalysts for uh, the rebirth of downtown Durham. Uh, part of having private streets is that they can be privately maintained. Uh, and that would be able to allow us to keep these streets in uh, uh, excellent condition uh, for the long haul, uh, as was done with the uh, original American Tobacco Campus. Uh, I defer to Tim if he's got any other insights on it, but certainly the, the maintenance aspect 
uh, is something that I know our team takes very seriously. Uh, we wish to have the right to maintain these streets privately to keep them in excellent condition for decades to come. Uh, Tim or, or Earl, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, Patrick, I think you hit the, you're exactly right on what, on the intent of why they want to be private. And just to clarify, you know, private streets are allowable within the UDO. Um, this is, as we stated at the beginning, this is a unique development within this downtown design district. It is 11 acres. I don't think you're going to find too many 11 acre projects to be redeveloped in, in downtown Durham. The UDO requires that projects of this size be broken up into what they call block standards um, to be separated by streets. And these streets can be private if certain measures are met, which is to provide stormwater control measures within the streets as well. So a lot of the street trees that you'll, you'll see on the site plan are actually going to be the stormwater control measures as well. So what we are proposing is allowable by the UDO. All right, well, thank you. Um... I'm going to just say this for the record. Is there anyone in uh, here to speak against this application? Seeing and hearing none, we'll continue. Uh, Eliza, do you have a recommendation for the group? Good morning again, everybody. Yes, I do. Um, I will pull that up. Uh, staff recommends the approval of minor special use permit case number B2100025 with the condition being that the improvement shall be consistent with the application and information submitted and presented here before the board um, as part of the application and the site plan case number D2100047. All right, uh, we have a recommendation from staff. Is there any discussion, thoughts, or concerns? Mr. Chair, I'm ready to make a motion if that's appropriate. Absolutely, go ahead. Um, I hereby make a motion that application number B2100025, an application for a minor special use permit to permit an alternative street design on property located at 601 Willard Street, has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. One, that the improvement shall be substantially consistent with the information submitted to the board as part of the application and site plan case D2100047. All right, we've got a motion for approval by Mr. Meadows. Is there a second? O'Shane, second. Natalie, then O'Shane on the second. Uh, will you, Jessica, will you call the board? Yes, sir. Rogers? Yes. Meadows? Yes. Kip? Yes. Retchless? Yes. Why more? Yes. Jeter? Yes. And Boucher? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero approved. A uh, vote of seven to zero, your minor special use permit has been approved. We thank you for coming before the BOA this morning and wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate everyone. all your time. All right, uh, does uh, y'all wanna take a, a quick 10 minute break? Is that okay with you? So we're at uh, 1028. Let's come back in 12 minutes at 1040. How about that? See you then.
All right, I think we're almost, uh, we're all here almost. Um, Um, Jessica, would you like to call the next case? Our next case is case B2100027, a city case. A request for a variance from the infill standards for a reduced street yard. The subject site is located at 825 West Markham Avenue, is zoned residential urban M or RUM, and is in the urban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time. Property owners within 600 feet have been notified and notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailing are on file. If Ms. Wymore is leaving at 11, I suggest we call in another alternate. Okay, so the seating will be Kip, Meadows, Rogers, Retchless, Wymore, I'm sorry, not Wymore, she's leaving, Jeter, Major and Bouchane. So Major will step in for why more. Uh, Tisha, good to see you this morning. We appreciate you. We'll see you next month. Um, all right. So everybody who, I guess we see, I see one person. If there's anyone else who's going to be, we'll need your camera on. Uh, but if you'll raise your right hand, Mr. Hennessy, and we'll uh, go through those. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. And do you consent to this remote meeting platform? I do. Thank you, sir. Um, Cole, is this one yours? Yes, it is. Take it over. All right. Um, good morning. I'm Corninger, representing the plan department. Uh, planning, planning staff requests that the staff board and all materials submitted to the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any, <clears throat> any necessary corrections as noted. I noted. Thank you. Um, case B twenty one zero 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 two seven is a request for a variance from the infill standards for reduced street yard. The case area is highlighted in red. The site is on residential urban RUM in the urban development tier and is in the city of Durham's jurisdiction. The existing use is vacant residential. Um, Thomas J. Hennessy of West Forth LLC requests a variance from the infill, infill standards of 25 foot street yard um, for a small lot option residence. Uh, unified Development or its UDO section 6.8.2 requires that the street yard shall be any distance between the smallest and largest street yard within the context area. The street yard in no instance shall be less than five feet. The applicant plans to use a lot. The small lot option per UDO section 7.1.2C as is as is permitted in the RUM zoning district in any tier by right. The small lot option has a minimum street yard of 10 feet, but due to the infill standards, there is an approximate street yard of 25 feet um, as determined by the setbacks on the face of the 800 block of the south side of West Markham Avenue. The applicant is requesting the use of a 10 foot standard for small lots, small lots, but then the infill standards resulting in a 15 foot reduction in the street yard. Um, UDO section 3.14.8 establishes the findings listed below. The Board of Adjustment must make in granting a variance. These findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses. So the findings and review factors are identified in the application, both within your packet. Staff will be available for any questions as needed during the hearing process. Thank you, Cole. Are there any questions for Cole? Uh, Chad. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Cole. Um, this is, I, I don't remember us seeing a, a small lot development case before, so that's interesting, and I, I like that there is this kind of provision in the UDO. Um, I had a question for you um, about small lot development and uh, the, the, the decision to require small lot development to comply with the infill standards. Um, if, if, you know, if you know any more about why that was done, that would be great. One more question for you, which is, you know, do the infill standards take into account um, the structure at 1012 North Duke, um, which is, I guess, the property immediately to the I guess it's the west of this site, um, which is, is significantly closer, I think, 
to the West Markham Avenue roadway. Um, so if you could just uh, enlighten me a little bit about why the small lot developments are subject to the infill standards, and then secondly, um, whether or not the infill standards would address, would take into account, um, you know, this lot on, on 1012 Duke, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Tintail Duke is uh, technically not on the same block front based on the street address. Um, so that's why it's not taken into account as far as taking that, that property into, um, into account. Um, we've never had a small lot option case before um, that came to the board. Um, it's just the way the code is written, even though it allows that option, the infill standards are still there. Um, it may be reviewed in the future because the small option is fairly new. Um, and maybe if, if something like this happens a lot and it and it looks like it may be a good idea to exempt them from, you know, it would change right now. But right now it's just added to that one section about house type. Um, and it hasn't it hasn't been looked at as, you know, in several different areas. But infill standards are there to protect areas. Um, and that's why it's technically still, you know, has to meet those those rules. All right, any other questions for Cole? I have a question, Kip. Mm -hmm. So this is a shared driveway leading to the small lot at the back of the lot, is that right? Yeah, um, so the small lot is, um, when you do a small lot option, the ribbon driveway design is, is required. Um, and that, that driveway has to be shared between those two properties. Um, but, I, and I believe, um, the, I can have the applicants can speak to this. Um, I believe it's the it's the um, front property that you're requesting the setback for. Is that correct, Thomas? This, Say that again. Area, um, where my cursor is, that's where the setback is. Correct? Because this is the that small is correct. Lot. Yes, this that is, is correct. the small lot, and over here is the other lot. Is that correct? That's owned here. by it looks like uh, right Francis. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the this small lot in the back is conforming. It's got a shared driveway. It's ten foot, but five foot for each on each property. It looks like, is that right? I believe so. Yes. Okay. And so they're they're seeking a front yard, a street yard, a street yard because this is right here is ten feet, and normally by infill standards it would have to be twenty five feet based on the block face of this of the street so the other the other ones are approximately 25 feet from the street and if you apply the infill standards it would be 25 feet but small lot options without infill standards are only a 10 feet separate all right. okay so i mean basically the hardship here is created because the applicant has decided they want to create a small lot in the back the, right? the small lot has already been created Okay, so the small lot was created by the applicant? Um, yes, and, and approved through city planning and, and the plat has already been recorded. Okay, so, but that plat now, that requires this variance today? Correct. Uh, just as a, a brief background, when we submitted our uh, building permit for the house that we had designed, um, that's when the planning uh, department came back to us and stated that the infill standards actually mandated a 25 foot yard. And, you know, I, we were quite surprised by it. And this is a very rare you know, thing to see in downtown Durham where the homes to the east on Markham, on the south side of Markham are just, they're all set 25 foot back. I mean, I can't think of another street in downtown that doesn't have a home approximately 10 feet away from the street. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's a rare location, unique location. Gotcha. So normally you'd have the option of, of um, I guess the average of the existing street yards, but that's not gonna fly because they're all 25 feet off. The yeah, street. that's correct. Hey, staff, okay. staff would yeah. like to mention though, um, at the time the plot was approved, um, you know, we didn't see the house. So um, it's, the house was technically, they're not creating a hardship. 
because the hardship wasn't um, so until they build that house, there is no hardship. It's just an empty lot that meets UDO standards. So they didn't technically create the hardship because there's not a house there yet. Um, so that it's it's a technical, it's a little gray area there, but it is it is. That. Okay. Would normally not these two go hand in hand? Because, in other words, creating one wouldn't create the condition for the other. Right, but creating creating the small lot um, doesn't necessarily mean they couldn't build there with the, with the infill lots, um, with the infill standard setbacks. In other words, if they created a small lot and they wanted to use the infill standard um, standards, they could, and they would be in compliance. The variance is because they want they want to reduce tree yard. That's I see how you're saying they go hand in hand. I'm just saying technically the applicant didn't take any action to create the hardship because as of right now it's vacant. Okay, if they built person. the house and then came back and asked for the variance, that would be a self-created hardship. Okay. But since it's before, it's, it's not. Right. Were the lot lines moved? I'm just looking. Um, it, West Forth also owns the property on Duke Street, right? That's correct. We purchased 1012 North Duke Street uh, and then engaged a surveyor to subdivide and create 825 West Markham, um, which, you know, as, as Cole did say, it, it is a, a legal small lot. Uh, it does fit everything uh, that's designed and laid out here. It does fit with the small lot regulations in the UDO. You're talking about the, the, the rear, the rear of A25 Markham, right? Uh, when you say the rear, what do you mean? Um, the back small lot. Is it? Are there two lots proposed at 825? No, no it is just a single small lot that fronts Markham uh, for a single family house. That's all. Okay, sorry, I, I misunderstood that. Okay, I'm good. Yep. All right, any other questions for Cole? All right, uh, would the applicant like to come forward? Sure, and uh, and forgive me for for speaking without introducing myself. At first, my name is Tom Hennessy. Uh, this is my uh, first time before this board. I am the member manager of West Forth LLC. Um, we have been uh, investing and in, in purchasing rental properties in Durham since approximately 2011, 2012. I have one business partner, and um, you know we we try to do great work in the city of Durham. Um, this is a property, as I, as I mentioned, uh, that we first bought 1012 North Duke Street. It was somewhat of an oversized lot. Um, and upon looking at the, uh, the UDO and the new small lot provisions that you know, the Durham Planning and Zoning and the City Council had put into effect to create housing supply within downtown and, and throughout Durham, that this was a candidate to, to create a small lot uh, and to build a single family house. Uh, and that's what we intended to do. You know, normally what we see is infill standards, while base zoning may say, you know, for example, a, a 25 or a 20 street yard base zoning, infill may say, well, the house to your left, you know, to the east or to the west, because that is at eight feet from your street, you actually can bring your house forward. Um, you know, it's, it is pretty rare in my opinion, what I've seen is, it's pretty rare for infill to actually reduce your building footprint or to limit uh, the house that you can build. And certainly uh, with this being a case of first impression, um, there, there haven't been too many small lot developments in downtown Durham and certainly not one that infill standards actually had the opposite effect of increasing a street yard on an already small lot. Um, so, as previously stated, this lot uh, was approved uh, when we when we did the subdivision by planning and zoning. Uh, we designed a single family house, um, no no greater than 1,200 square feet to be built here. Um, upon application for our building permit to build a home, planning department had said that because of the infill, because of the unique uniqueness of the south side of Markham, the fact that the other houses are set back 25 feet, unfortunately, that actually increases your street yard to 25 feet rather than what is 
compliant and well within the UDO for small lots, uh, which is a 10 foot street yard. Uh, and then it was, it was the advice on, on planning um, after I'd reached out to talk about the issue. Since again, this is also new, we haven't seen this before, um, that we would apply for a variance and, and hopefully get the, uh, get the support from planning and zoning as well, which I, I do believe that we have. Um, so it's a relatively straightforward request where we are simply asking for a variance to allow us to build a single family house pursuant to the small lot uh, regulations, which allow for a 10 foot street yard and to be uh, and to receive a variance from the infill standards. Any questions? Right. I'm sorry, Mr. Hennessy. Yeah, any, I was just going to ask if there are any other questions. Are there any questions for the applicant? I don't. I don't see anyone, uh, Chair. Slipping through here, I don't see anybody either. Um, all right. Is there anyone? Uh, Cole, would you uh, stop sharing for a moment? Is there anyone here to uh, that is um, anyone else? Speaking in favor of this application. Any anyone speaking against this application for variance? Very none, seeing none. Okay. Uh, there is no uh, recommendation from staff on this one. Uh, discussion, thoughts. <coughs> Correct. I think the small lot development concept is good. I think it's one that's being used more frequently around the state. Um, I think that, um, you know, it, this applicant was caught in the middle of an, an, an infill standard that is a context-based standard versus uh, a, a, an approach to accommodate more housing. Um, and as a, you know, sort of as a result of that approach, there's a reduction to the setback um, so I, I don't know if it is or isn't appropriate to apply the infill standards. Um, they apply, so we're here. We are today. Um, you know, I I like the idea of the small lot development. I think it's appropriate. I think it addresses a problem we have. Um, I understand that that small lot development needs to be consistent with the with its surroundings. On the other hand, you know, by its nature. Um, it's something that is different than, than what is, um, you know, uh, on other lots. Um, I think that it would have been interesting to know, um, how far the house next door on 1012 North Duke street is from the street, uh, or how far the streets across Markham, um, are from the street, whether or not they are 25 feet or they're closer. Um, it looked to me like the houses across the street were actually closer to the, to Markham Street than the houses on the same block face that's proposed for development. So, you know, that's neither here nor there with this variance case, just an issue with respect to how we determine context in the infill um, rubric. So, um, you know, I, I don't know that I have a problem with, with, with this. We have this small lot thing we created. It's a 10 foot setback. It doesn't fit with another set of rules that we've got. Uh, I don't think the applicant created that issue. Uh, I think it's an issue in our in our rules, um, but it's new, so you know maybe it just wasn't foreseen. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I think I, I don't I don't know that I have a problem supporting this. I do hope that we go back and have a look and see if if you know going forward we're going to continue to apply infill if we're going to keep getting hung up in these in these in these. Uh, variance requests for setbacks uh, because we've allowed this small lot to be built. I, I hope we, you know, that we explore some alternatives to how we do infill, um, the infill standards. Um, that's it. Sure, Mr. Rechlis, did you have something? <clears throat> well, I think Mr. Meadows covered a lot of that too. And, and um, I, I drove that site, uh, some like extra turn off on that uh, Markham, um, it seems like parking is already on that street and, uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm for the variance for, uh, this particular property. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? All 
All right. Does anyone want to offer a motion? I hereby make a motion that case number B21000027, an application for the variance from infill standards for reduced street yard requirements on property located at 825 West Markham Avenue, has successfully met the application requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. The improvement shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as a part of this application. All right, we've got a motion for approval by Ms. Peter. Is there a second? Meadows, second. Meadows, second. Uh, Jessica, would you call the board? Yes. Kip. Yes. Meadows. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Retchless. Yes. Jeter. Yeah. Major. Yes. Bouchain. Yeah. Motion carries seven to zero approved. Uh, vote of seven to zero. Your request for a variance has been approved. Yeah, we thank you for coming in before the BOA this morning and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Good day. Uh, Jessica, you want to call the next Thank case? you. Have a great Our next case is B2100028, a city case. A request for a variance from the 10-foot no-build riparian buffer setback. The subject site is located at 3820 Lock Nora Parkway, is zoned Residential Suburban 20 or RS20, and in the suburban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time. Property owners within 600 feet have been notified and notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. All right. Uh, everyone who plans on giving testimony will need your um, camera on to administer the oath. All right. Um, and Jordan, on that side, I see two folks on here. I want to make sure we get both of your names. Would you mind um, giving us both of your names? Um, I'm Jordan Van Romberg. And I'm Pamela Wyman. All right. Uh, all right. So everybody who plans on giving testimony, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, Jordan? Yes. Pamela? Yes. Uh, Anne? Hi. Anya. I'm sorry? Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, I, it, do you plan on giving uh, testimony, Ms. Light? I am an adjacent property owner. Yes, I have stuff to say. All right. So we'll need to get you, uh, have uh, your testimony. So, uh, or we'll have to swear you in. Uh, would you mind raising your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right. And do you uh, consent to this remote meeting platform? Yes. All right. Pamela, do you consent to this remote meeting platform? Yes. Jordan? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Cole, is this one yours? Yes. Make it over. Good morning again. I'm Cole Ranger, representing the plan department. Planning staff requests the staff report and all materials submitted to the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. Noted, thank you. B210028 is a request from the variance from the 10 foot no bill setback from a stream buffer. The case area is highlighted in red. The site is in the residential suburban RS20 and the suburban development tier within the city of Durham's jurisdiction. The existing use is single family. Um, Pamela Wyman, owner and applicant, requests a variance to encroach six feet into a riparian buffer 10 foot no build setback in order to add a screen porch to the northeast corner of the existing house. The porch would extend north from a deck that encroaches into the 10 foot no build setback, ending at the north corner of the main house, which also encroaches into the 10 foot no build setback and into the riparian buffer itself. 
reunified development ordinance um, section 8.5.9 C buildings and other features that require grading and construction shall be set back at least 10 feet from the edge of repairing buffer. Placing the screen porch in the proposed location will cause a six foot encroachment into the 10 foot no build setback. The UDO section 3.14.8 establishes the findings listed below. The Board of Adjustment must make in granting any variance. These findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings and review factors are identified in the application, both within your packet. Staff will be available for any questions as needed during the hearing process. All right, thank you, Cole. Are there any questions for Cole before we hear from the applicant? All right, um, Ms. Wyman or yeah, I can speak. Hi. Um, hello. So I don't have a presentation prepared, um, but as we see here, this is our home. Um, there is a, a lot next to it that is part of the Loch Nora property. It's not used for anything. I mean, it's an open sort of common space. There's the creek there. Um, the house as it was built originally, you know, we just purchased the house a few months ago. So um, anyway, we purchased the house and the house was built into the, or maybe before the variance was established. I mean, I'm sorry, not the variance, the riparian buffer, I believe. Um, so the house is in the buffer zone. There's a, from my understanding, there's the creek and then there's 50 feet of no build zone. And then there's an additional 10 feet of buffer zone. Is that right, Cole? So there's a 50 foot riparian buffer. And then okay. on top of that, there's the 10 foot no build. That's right, okay. So the 10 foot no build is what we would like to um, extend the deck into. The current situation is that the current deck the edge of the deck, essentially, if we built a screened porch on that, it would go right through the back window, the living room main window of the house, um, obscuring a view. Um, so we would like to extend the deck six feet so that it essentially um, matches the, the dimension, the edge of the, house. edge of the house, thank you, the edge of the house. Um, and build a screened porch on that eventually. So that's what we are aiming to do is this small extension um, towards the creek that matches the house. Okay. Um, I'll take the opportunity to ask, uh, do you have an idea of how the dimensions of the deck and then secondly, uh, how many feet it would encroach on, on this no deck? No build setback. Do you have any well, idea? Well, as Cole said, we were requesting six feet. Mm -hmm. um, that that would be our our ideal scenario, um, and we don't know the dimensions of the deck. We just know that we don't want the post of the deck to go right through the window of the living room. Um, Mr. Meadows, do you have something? I, I, I do, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to understand a little bit more about what's proposed. It sounds like there is a, a request to extend the deck. And it, is this deck um, above grade? Is it, is it at grade? Is it above grade? Um, how far above grade? How will the deck be supported? Is it piers? Is it posts? Is it going to be some kind of curtain wall? And then ultimately there's going to be a structure that's built atop the deck. Um, so how tall is that? And does that have a roof and, and how does that work? Okay. Should I, should I respond? Please. Yeah. Okay. So Cole has photographs and all the materials that I, that I understood I was supposed to submit. I did submit, I can pull them up on my phone, but we are not currently at the home. Um, I guess, the deck is built, I mean, it, and I don't know the answer to all the terms you're asking, I'm sorry. It's a deck that I would guess is 
two and a half feet off the ground with posts. Um, it's nothing fancy. We don't need a fancy deck. We just don't want the post to go through the window. I think the first step that we understood was to come to you and pay this fee and ask if we can extend the deck several feet so that it doesn't go through the back window um, and re and then you know rebuild it or modify it. Um, so that's what we're doing. And, and then the second piece, once we have the funds would be to eventually build a screened porch on it. And I don't, and there's no design. We don't have the design yet. I mean, there will be a roof. Yes, there will be a roof on it um, because we want to have it the, you know, screen porch. And really what we're just asking for is to widen the porch uh, so it can match up with the house. Mm. Okay. A uh, follow-on question: it, Would would it be possible? Uh, it sounds like maybe um, you you might be reconstructing the deck. Uh, maybe maybe not. I don't know. And I understand you don't know that yet. Um, along those lines, would it be possible to extend the deck to the? I guess it's the north east, um, so that you could run along instead of within the the no build. Uh, area uh, and still avoid the, um, the, the the living room window view. No, there would be no way to extend it, let's say vertically. So the deck sits, you know, along the back wall of the house. And if it was, if we built a screened porch on it eventually, then it would absolutely run through the back window, the post would, unless we extend it horizontally towards the creek. The, the, the problem is that we, are, that we have is that the house was built um, into this no build zone that was created later on. And so for us to widen the porch, uh, I mean, for if, even if we, I mean, if we wanted to not even go through the window, if we just add on a little, we will automatically go into the no build zone because the house is in the no build zone. The, the no build zone or the buffer, the 10 foot buffer was apparently added on later. After the house was after built. After the house was built. So that is where we are running into the problem. And, and go ahead, I'm sorry. This is Jean, from the picture that Cole has up, it looks like a por portion of your deck is already in the no build zone. Is that right? Like the corner, uh, Northwest. West. Yeah, we, we believe so based on the, that's our impression. Okay. I, I think uh, uh, Chad's question was, and I, I, Chad, I hope I got this right. I don't know if, but basically going Northeast, meaning uh, pushing the deck out further rather yeah. than going uh, toward the end of the house, if you will. What is that what you were asking, Chad? It, it is. I, I was curious about why that was was not a possibility. Um, I, I wanted to understand um, wh why that option simply was not available. That that is an option for sure, um, but that doesn't solve the problem of the window going right through the post going through the window. Uh, so I'm going to try to understand. Sorry. So there's a, a a picture window on the north eastern wall adjacent to the edge of the deck and it's the support the vertical support for the roof of the porch that would interfere with the view of that window is that is that right that's right that's right like right now if we look at our living room window there's a you know a bit of the po the edge of the deck goes right through the middle of the window so if we built a screened porch on that um it would be um, it would, it would block the view. I mean, obviously the view, view will be impeded by the screened porch if we ever even build it, but we understood this was the first step is first figuring out, can we extend the deck even a couple feet so that it's out of the, it doesn't obscure the window. Right. And I understand that this is the first time around um, and you guys are just getting started. Um, so you're, you're not sure, you don't know if it would be necessary to rebuild the deck to support the additional load from the, 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 the screened in porch. Uh, it's entirely possible that all of that deck 
would have to be removed in order yeah. to reach yeah. to, to put in the yeah the, but you don't know that i mean we have been told by two contractors we spoke with that it would likely need to be mostly or all rebuilt yes okay but i mean what we're looking for is to expand the footprint so mm -hmm. that again we don't have the edge of the screened porch going right through the middle of the window right are, are, is there any way for you to accommodate uh, a screened-in porch on this site in a way, uh, since the deck likely needs to be rebuilt anyway, um, in, a, in a slightly different location that would allow you to avoid this um, no-build area? Mm, no, I... Um... Okay, that, that's what you need to prove. That That's answering that question is really what this what this whole thing hinges on that yeah i understand there, there's no there's no other option if you built straight out from the i mean unless it was like unless it was two feet wide and mm -hmm. there's that's the only back door so yeah there's one yeah. back door and then to the right of it is is a wall like which is the kitchen window and nook breakfast nook and we, if we would have to we would have to uh we would have to I don't see any way take, to build that. No, we would have to take out the windows. We would, we no, would have that's to not, change the geez. structure of the house. We would not want to do that. That would, that would require taking down a back, an entire back wall, restructuring our kitchen. That's not something we would be, no. ever be able to do. Okay. Um, thank you. I, 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 I want to make a note to the chair, but I'll do, I'll do that later. Thank you. All right, uh, any question, any other questions for the applicant? I, I think I heard the applicant say there were other pictures. Is there a reason that we haven't seen them or they weren't a part of the packet? So staff had not received any pictures via email um, from Pamela. Um, I just double checked oh. um, my email. Oh, I, I, I did send pictures to you and to, um, Eliza um, at some point and I can resend them but we I definitely um, had a discussion with either you or Eliza where they said oh the pictures are very helpful so I can look those up again um, I mean at but, this time they would they would be they weren't spending time so I don't know if they'd be considered um, because they would they would the board would be speaking them now as well as the, um, the can opponent. I show you this picture please so we can We've waited many months for this, and I'd like to just have the opportunity to show you a picture of what it looks like so you can um, envision. So can I can I have my screen put back on? We actually um, don't allow applicants um, to share screens, but- um... No, no, I'm not asking to share my screen. I'm asking to show you a, a picture that's on my phone so that we don't have to go through months more of um, red tape. Yeah, um, yeah, your your screen is actually on. Your camera's on. Oh, okay. I can't um, see. But I'll myself. but I'll let the, I'll let the chair make that decision. Um, if you want to. Well, unfortunately, Miss Wyman, like we would all need to like be able to see it. Um, you know, usually th th all of this these items are, um, um, you know, in our, we have a packet that would be included. We'd all, you know, so well, you know, we really it's it's really hard to see and, and to make out because it's so small on our screens and, and it, we'd really need it before. Um, so, I, so, so this is just so you know, this is from an email I sent to Eliza back in May and she, and she did receive this picture. So I'm sorry to hear that it didn't make it into your packet, but I don't think that's from any neglect on my end. Um, there's a whole email thread with Eliza where I sent these pictures, um, Miss Monroe and um, that she then transferred it to Cole and there's more pictures. And so I'm frustrated because I've tried to do everything possible to provide the information, pay the $900, et cetera, to have this rec um, reviewed. I completely understand. Um, um, I'm sorry. So it's actually, it was actually included in another it was actually, I believe, included in part of in part of a, an application that was with the survey. So, I think the survey actually may include the pictures. Um, actually, I think this is a different property. 
but I don't, I don't, I believe, um, Ms. Wyman, is there, is there an air conditioning unit near that window that you're referencing? Is there an air conditioning unit? I just, I just don't know if this is the exact, the right no. property. I just want to make sure. Is your house yellow? That's probably it is. easy. It's okay. kind of. I think I, let me, I'm going to screen share this with everyone and just, just let me know um, if these are the right pictures. Um, just give me one, one second, please. Thank you. I'm trying to I'm trying to open it um, with a different I'm gonna, I'm gonna have them open. Um, I'm trying to enter these in presentation mode, but it's, it's giving me a hard time. Um, but if I can zoom in, if you guys need me to, um, just let me, let me know. Is this the correct picture? It, oh. it is not. Okay. Um, so this, then I do not have photos from you guys. Um, I looked through my email and I don't, I don't see any photos that were sent to me. Um, okay. So I guess um, it got somehow lost in the shuffle of emails with Eliza, but I definitely have sent pictures before per her request. I drew a, I, I, I don't know if you can see my screen right now, but this is an image of what it looks like. All right, well, Ms. Wyman, if you don't mind, just uh, uh, forward that email again to, um, you know, the folks um, to, to Cole and we'll, we'll get that, we'll get this settled. But uh, if you're able to do that. Yeah, of course. Of, of what you sent, Eliza. All right, um, any other questions while she is doing that? Any other questions by the board that? Uh, Natalie? Yeah, I have a quick question. Would it change the landscape any? Would you have to remove any trees to extend the deck? Mm, Not. If, I mean, we could extend it probably like a foot or two. To, to widen the deck. Oh, to widen. I'm sorry. Do you mean to move to. it into this buffer? No. To follow your existing plans, what you're asking for. No, um, no, no okay. trees would need to be removed. Sorry. Yeah, no trees. But it sounds like it may, you may have to remove trees if you went out further away from the house. So you were going to say, I'm trying to. I mean, we don't need a big expansive deck like this deck is very small we're fine with it being small we just want to extend it a couple of feet you know because of this window thing if we instead went vertically meaning like i think you called it northeast or what have you then we could probably go another foot or two i don't know if we would opt to do that but um i don't know if it would be worth it but we would not need to remove trees going either direction with the modest plans that we have all right uh, Mr. Rachels. So you, you mean like plans, like not documented, like text plans drawn out? You mean plans in your head? <laughs> plans <laughs> in our plans in our head. I had the okay. impression via so conversations here. with Eliza that we were not required to have actual drawn up plans, and we didn't want to necessarily spend money on those without knowing if it would even be a possibility to do this project? Well, for myself, um, to determine, I mean, all the factors I, are okay in my, except for the, you know, the spirit and purpose and intent for the safety of the public, because it's a, um, 
uh, a buffer, um, it, I think it would help you to have even a sketch of how this deck is built um, to support putting it in the buffer. Um, you know, that is the, the, the subject here. So, um, you know, any kind of picture of the back of the house or, you know, a sketched in, hey, I'm putting four by four posts, things like that will definitely help your case. Um, you know, I, I want to see what, what you propose, um, what kind of footing, things like that um, in this buffer. And I know the house was built before it, um, it was ad adopted, but, um, you know, it is what we have now. Um, and that's my take on this. And so the, the picture, thank you so much for your feedback. The picture that I did send to Ms. Monroe that I then just forwarded minutes ago to Cole um, does show the back of the house. And I do have a, you know, a drawing of a pot one potential small screened porch that I can forward. I was not told that I needed to provide that in conversations with um, your folks, but I hear you now. Chair Rogers, I am going to attempt to share the picture if you will bear with me just a moment. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think the reason it was missed is because it wasn't sent as an attachment, it was sent in the body of an email. Um, so I think it was missed because it was included in the email not sent as a separate attachment. Okay. And generally we don't, we can't include the whole email on um, the message record because, you know, back and forth between people and message record. Yep. All right. And uh, just, just for the record, I guess, do you have an idea between the deck and the end of the house there, how many feet that would be? So it's six feet, is that what you were saying? So, yeah, the current deck is 12 feet square. It's very, it's small. I mean, it's 12 feet by 12 feet. Okay. And even if we can just extend it past that window, I don't know if you can see that, I mean, she drew a red line there because that's the end of the house. But even if we can just extend it past the window, um, because we would love to not have the pole right through the window. So with the end of the window, if it can go past that, that will be great too. All right, does, uh, does this photo help any of the board members? <laughs> it, this is Meadows. Um, I think it is helpful to understand that the request, as I understand it right now, that the hardship that we're dealing with that the applicant has is that they have this deck and they want to put a screened in porch on the deck. And in order to put the roof structure necessary for a screened in porch on the deck, it's got to have an upright. It's got to have a, a, a post. And because the deck is where the deck is, the post would be in front of the window and they don't want that. They would prefer not to have that. And so they're requesting to extend the deck um, so that the post for the screened in porch is not in front of the window. So that, that makes sense and is understandable. It's very helpful to have the picture um, to kind of explain you know, what was going on. Um, through the course of discussion, there was the possibility or at least the suggestion that it is it, it, it could be workable um, to extend the deck uh, by less than six feet um, and reduce the impact in the no build buffer and still allow these folks to, to, to you know, have the screened in porch and overcome the hardship that they're facing. Um, you know, it would certainly be uh, easier for me to approve a reduced extension into the buffer uh, than it would be a, a, a six foot extension. Um, I, I will say that, you know, it, it sounds to me like the deck needs to be rebuilt anyway. Uh, and so that seems like it opens the realm of possibilities for how uh, a, a, a screened in porch might, might be accommodated in ways that, that don't require any um, extension into the buffer. Um, 
but you know we don't have those plans so that's not anything we can 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 ruminate on speaking for myself i'm more comfortable having the picture is helpful i understand the issue the question now is you know does avoidance of a post in front of the window rise to the level of a hardship or not and i think that's really the question um if it does then you know moving the post to the north northeast whatever um that might solve the hardship is there a way for that to happen uh and and minimize the impact on the buffer in accordance with the spirit of the ordinance i think that's the question on my mind right now um and how we you know it, it, is it i understand these people have been waiting a long time i understand the frustration i understand the red tape i get all of that um at the same time i have asked other applicants for variances to produce um, information for the record so that it's on the record what what we're approving um, and I am going to hold to that um, uh, that approach or that method of, of operating in this case um, if, if it is possible to get some additional information or explore deeper the possibility of a reduced extension into the buffer um, I'm more I'm, I'm able to see how, that is more consistent with the UDO. Um, and, you know, if, if I was asked to vote on what we had before us today, I would have to vote no, because I don't think there's enough information on the record about what we're approving. Right, Mr. Um, Retchless. Got you on mute, good sir. Jessica, thank you for that photograph. Um, Yes. And I see very clearly now what you're trying to do, and that has really helped me um, make the decision. And I'm for I'm for this variance, um, and um, you will definitely be, um, you know, dealing with inspections department on how you can go forth with that. Um, but I think uh, it's consistent in the spirit, and uh, I don't have any problem with it. Congratulations. Uh, anybody else? Can, I'm sorry. Can I add one thing? Yeah. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I did find a very preliminary sketch of what a screened porch could look like. And I have just forwarded it via email to Cole. And I know it's late to add things, but um, if that's helpful to bring up another picture, then we have that. Yeah, well, I think right now we can't, we can't take that in right now. But okay. Um, is there anyone else? Let me just make you guys. Oh, Micah. So my question is, if we were to approve this, could we approve it to say something like up to six feet, which would allow them the flexibility of bringing it in to Mr. Meadows' suggestion once they actually got with the contractor or whoever's going to help them do it so that they have some flexibility to maybe not go the full six feet, but, or is that always the case? Yeah, we would, it would be up to a certain. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, all right, anybody else have anything? Uh, all right, uh, is there anybody else here to speak in favor of this application? Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak against? Uh, Ms. Little, do you have something you'd like to say? Um, it's Ann Light. Um, Sorry, Light, I, I apologize. It's okay. It's that mistake's been made before. I um, I received a letter about this, so I am apparently close enough to be adjacent. My property is actually located in Winstead, which is across the street and beyond um, from the property. I appreciate what Mr. Meadows and Mr. Rutschless have said about concern and um, the Army Corps of Engineers and the city of Durham has have learned a lot about stormwater runoff since that house was built. Um, that stream adjacent to their property runs in a culvert under the street to wetland that is between Loch Nora and Winstead. Um, the culvert carries that water and that wetland fills during storms, such as Tropical Storm Elsa that came through on July 8th of this year. Um, 
additional runoff might disturb the trees, might disturb um, the shape of that stream and construction may cause additional problem as people are in that area as the deck were rebuilt and the screen ports were added. Um, I'm concerned about downstream impacts to other properties in Loch Nora, to um, my property, um, and further down in um, Carillon Woods, there's another property, another construction going on on the other side of Randolph Road. Um, there's a lot of development in this area, and that concerns me. So if it were approved, I would like to know how many trees are going to be disturbed, whether any of them are likely to survive. Um, can the homeowner, homeowner be required to plant additional trees? And what is the siltation There's requirement the during and post construction? All right. Um, Ms. Wyman, do you have any rebuttal? You, uh, this this isn't a, usually doesn't go back and forth, but there, the applicant does have the chance to provide, uh, address those concerns and provide a rebuttal. Thank you. Um, as we stated, a couple times in our the meeting here, there are no trees that will be removed whatsoever. So that's not a topic that needs to be considered. Um, and we've already added more, you know, another tree to the. I mean, anyway, I don't understand the concern with that. But as we said, there's no trees that would be affected. There, there, are, there are no trees um, on on the remotely in the area that if we wanted to extend, let's say two feet to go to the window, extend it even two feet, just so it's not crossing the window. If you look at the picture, um, then there, there will be no trees to be removed. There are no trees. Yeah, um, the, the trees that are there are in the back of the house, in the backyard, or really just along the along the creek along the creek but we that we won't touch all right um mr retchels hi yeah pamela and jordan is the deck going to be consistent with the elevation of the existing deck you have now you're just kind of extending it over above grade even with the um, level of your living space. Is that fair we, to say? Yeah, I would be happy to do whatever is recommended that makes the least impact on the impervious structure. Okay. We're happy to do whatever is recommended by the board and by the powers that be. Okay. Well, it, 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 if we do grant this, you'll be uh, expected to get with the, the inspections department and they were they're a fine inspections department and they will help you along the way. Right. That's what I mean. I mean, if, if we were to do this, then we would absolutely do, you know, we're learning and we would do what's recommended. We're not looking to, um, you know, increase any problems for anyone. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, any, anybody from the board have any further thoughts? All right, um, I'll provide a few. Um, I think this this house is already uh, encroached. Going to the to the edge of the house, I don't have a problem. I don't see a problem with that. It's not impervious uh, uh, materials or surfaces there. Um, so um, you know, we're talking six feet to the end of the house. Um, I understand the hardship here, and I think the hardship was created uh, well after this um, this house was built, and it was due no fault of the homeowner. Uh, those are my those are my thoughts. Does anyone else? So I don't I don't have any concerns. I'm not concerned about the the runoff either. Does anybody else want to provide anything? I, mean, I would agree this is a unique situation um and i also agree with you that it's it should not and likely will not affect the runoff situation thanks anyone else
All right. Does uh, anyone want to offer a motion? There is no staff recommendation on this. I'd like to make a motion to grant application. This is retros with conditions. I, I hereby make a motion that case number B2100028, an application for a variance from the 10 foot no build setback. Property located at 3820 Lucknora Parkway has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions that the improvement shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of this application. We have a motion for approval for this variance by Mr. Ratchless. Is there a second? Peter, second. Second by Ms. Jeter. Jessica, take it away. Okay, Rogers, I forgot to call the seating for this. I'm sure you all know, but it will be Kip, Meadows, Rogers, Retchless, Jeter, Major, and Bouchane. All right. So Kip. Yes. Meadows. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Retchless. Yes. Jeter. Yes. Major? Yes. Boucher? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero approved. By a vote of seven to zero, your request for a variance has been approved. I appreciate your patience. I understand this is kind of a weird process and quasi-judicial is, is a, a little strange. Uh, thank you for coming for the BOA. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much you. for your time. All right. Um, well, that was... That was good. All right. Um, do we want to continue to the next case? Do we need a break? How, how is everybody feeling? Power through. We've got one, two, three more cases. We will only have two more because, well, I lied. You're correct, Chair. That's what, all right. Well, let's go ahead and call the next one. And we'll see what we can do after that. All right. Our next case is B21-00029, a city case. A request for a minor special use permit for a daycare in a residential zoning district. The subject site is located at 82 Kimberly Drive, is zoned residential suburban 10 or RS10, is in the falls of the Noose Jordan Lake Protected Area Watershed Protection Overlay, which is FJB, and in the, the suburban tier. The case has been advertised for the required period of time. Property owners within 600 feet have been notified and notarized affidavits verifying the sign posting and letter mailing are on file. The seating will be KIPP, Meadows, Rogers, Retchless, Jeter, Major, and Bouchain. All right, thank you, Jessica. Uh, everyone who plans on giving testimony will need your camera on. I'm looking here, I think we've got everybody. So uh, if you don't mind, raise your right hand. Um, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today? Uh, Biker, I think we've you're missing out of the camera. There you are. Um, uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth will come through here? Uh, Kelsey? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Uh, Marie? Uh, I will not be testifying today. I will be speaking, um, but uh, we are, it looks like we are waiting on uh, Jarvis Martin. Um, he is going to be one of our witnesses as well. Okay, uh, so you're not speaking today. Well, I will be speaking, but I'm not testifying as a witness. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, this is uh, my one of our colleagues, uh, new attorneys at Morningstar Law Group, and I wanted to let her uh, take a run at the Board of Adjustment with this uh, uh, minor special use permit for St. Stephen's uh, Episcopal Church down in Hope Valley. Uh, I told her you were all a very nice group of people, so I, I hope you'll live up to that standard. And uh, really appreciate y'all time. And uh, Marie, just for the heck of it, say say yes. <laughs> uh, Biker. Yes. Uh, Jarvis, uh, do you swear that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, uh, Jarvis, do you consent to this uh, remote meeting platform? Yes. Kevin. Yes. Kelsey. Yes. Biker. I'm Patrick. Mr. Biker. Yes. Uh, Marie? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, who has this one? It is me again. Oh, cool. There you are. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's all yours. All right. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> Cole Ringer, representing the planning department again. Um, planning staff request the staff report on materials submitted to the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any, any necessary corrections as noted. Noted. Thank you. 
Uh, case B 21000029 is a minor special use permit for a daycare in a residential zoning district. The case area is highlighted in red. The site is in the suburban tier zone residential suburban RS10 and is in within the city of Durham's jurisdiction. Um, the existing use is right now is the church and the preschool. Um, St. Stephen's Episcopal. Episcopal Church, sorry if that's not pronounced right, owner and applicant proposes to continue the existing uses of place of work in preschool with the addition of a daycare use. Um, the daycare is offered to preschool students who need full-time daycare instead of the half day provided by the preschool. Um, these properties are zoned residential RS10 and located in the suburban development tier, pre-unified development ordinance section 5.1.2. A daycare in a residential zone district is allowed with an approved minor specialties permit. The preschool will be run by the church and is considered an intensification of the existing place of worship use. Staff will be able for questions throughout the hearing process. Um, just to clarify, um, there is no exterior changes. Um, they are just adding the uh, daycare use to the existing preschool, basically in extended, extended hours. All right, uh, any questions for Cole before we hear from the applicants? Applicant. Seeing, hearing none. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Biker, do you have this one? I'll let Marie handle this one. Uh, she's got her outline teed up and she's ready to introduce our witnesses. And uh, we very much appreciate uh, y'all's time again on this, uh, on this item. Thank you. Marie, it's all yours. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, members of the board. Like Patrick said, my name is Marie Farmer. I'm an associate attorney with Morningstar Law Group here at uh, 112 West Main Street. Uh, as Patrick also said, um, we represent St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, who owns and operates a place of worship and a preschool on about 11 acres on Kimberly Drive. And we're here today to request a minor special use permit for St. Stephen's Preschool which has been at this location for over 50 years so that it can offer its students full days of care as opposed to half days that the preschool is currently offering. Uh, at the outset, I would like to ask that exhibits A through C relied upon or referred to by our witnesses, including the staff report and any attachments uh, be moved into evidence and that our witnesses uh, be tendered as experts in site engineering, traffic engineering, and real estate appraising uh, based on the exhibits A through C, uh, which are the resumes of each of the experts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, uh, the building that houses the preschool was built in 1977 and operated for several decades before the UDO was adopted in January 2006. The building is zoned residential suburban 10 and has about 3,552 square feet of classroom space and a fenced in playground that is approximately 29,568 square feet. The only modifications that will occur to the building are the addition of four doors so that each classroom has external doors to the fenced in playground. And this is required for state licensing. Uh, no other modifications to the current structure or landscaping will occur. And to address the required findings for a minor, minor special use permit under the UDO, um, you'll hear from our three witnesses today that the proposed daycare is in harmony with the area. There will not be substantially injurious impact on the value of the properties in the general vicinity of St. Stephen's. There will be no adverse impact on public health or safety, and the proposed use will be in conformance with the review factors under the UDO and the special requirements for limited use as applicable to this use uh, as a daycare facility. And these issues are going to be addressed by civil engineer Kelsey Westwood, uh, who is a professional engineer licensed here in the state of North Carolina. Um, Kevin Dean, PE, a traffic engineer who is also licensed by the state of North Carolina, who has 10 years of experience specializing in traffic operations and traffic engineering. And then finally, you will hear from real estate appraiser Jarvis Martin, who is a state certified general appraiser with 45 years of real estate appraisal experience. Based on their testimony, which is going to provide competent material and substantial evidence, uh, which will show all of the applicable standards of the UDO, uh, we will ask that you approve the minor special use permit application for the daycare. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelsey. Thanks, Marie. Um, 
Hello, I am Kelsey Westwood Hall. Um, I'm a civil engineer with Kinley Horn. Um, I've worked at Kinley Horn for five years and have um, been working as a civil engineer for seven years. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University and am a professional engineer licensed by the state of North Carolina. Um, St. Stephen's Preschool has been in operation for nearly 50 years and has not encountered any concerns with compatibility in the surrounding area. Uh, to convert the existing preschool into a daycare, the only proposed modification to the building is the addition of external doors to the fenced-in playground in accordance with state licensing requirements. The subject property is zoned RS10, as Marie mentioned, um, which allows daycare use with an approval of a minor special use permit. Uh, the lighting and signage on site will comply with standards outlined in the Unified Development Ordinance and all utilities to serve the building, including water and sewer, are existing on site and will remain unchanged with the conversion from a preschool to a daycare. Um, the existing structure had to meet the then current standards in place at the time of construction, um, but since there are no changes or increases proposed to the exterior limits of the structure or to the existing property, and the site is bordered by RS10 parcels, there will be no change to the existing setbacks, project boundary buffers, tree coverage, or concerns with environmental protection of the site from the originally approved plan. Uh, since the daycare is an extended use of the existing preschool, which is compatible within the existing neighborhood, uh, the proposed use is appropriate and compatible in design, scale, and relationship to other uses in the area. Additionally, there's no significant increase in noise or odor beyond the existing conditions as a result of this proposed minor special use permit. The existing use of St. Stephen's as a place of worship and preschool and the proposed use as a daycare is appropriate for the RS10 zoning district and meets the intent of the Unified Development Ordinance with a minor special use permit. The outdoor play space far exceeds the required 100 square foot per child as the playground is approximately 29,568 square feet and the daycare anticipates 65 to 80 children, which equates to over 300 square feet per child. Uh, the playground is also surrounded by fencing that is at least four feet high and is fenced in accordance with the standards set forth in section 9.9 .9 of the UDO. Uh, there will also be at least 35 heated square feet per child as required by section 5.3.3 of the UDO uh, because the total classroom square footage is approximately 3,552 square feet, which equates to 44 square feet per child. Uh, in conclusion, and in my professional opinion, approval of St. Stephen's application for the special use permit for this educational facility is in harmony with the area and there will be no adverse impact on public health and safety. All right, thank you, Kelsey. If anyone has any questions for Kelsey, um, she is available. If not, we will turn it over to Kevin. Any uh, questions for the witness? All right. Stand down. Go ahead. Morning. My name is Kevin Dean, and I'm also a civil engineer with Kinley Horn at 300 Moore Street in Durham. I've got a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from NC State, and I've been performing traffic analysis with Kinley Horn uh, for the last 10 years. Um, and, and I am also a professional engineer in the state of North Carolina. Um, as our team has noted, special use permit um, that would allow for the daycare um, in conjunction with the preschool um, is not anticipated to result in an increase in either staff or children and students um, on site. Uh, based on that, we're not anticipating any increases over the course of a day in trip generation associated with the special use permit. Um, there will be some uh, shifting of traffic across the day as some students are leaving later than they do today. Um, but the Institute of Transportation Engineers indicates that that total um, entering and exiting site traffic volume would be less than 30 trips um, if, all of those, uh, if all of those students left at the exact same time at the traditional peak hour. Um, so based on that minimal volume of additional traffic, uh, it's my professional opinion that approval of the special use permit would not cause undue traffic congestion or create on-site queuing issues. Um, the daycare use is not envisioned uh, to include changes to site access, circulation, or parking, um, as adequate parking and access are already provided for this use. And since no transportation related changes are proposed on site, it is also my professional opinion that approval of the special use permit will not materially endanger 
the public health or safety and will not impact safety for vehicles, including emergency vehicles circulating on site. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. Dean? All right. All right, and so with that, we will turn it over to Jarvis Martin. Uh, good morning again, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, you heard from my me twice today in terms of my qualifications. So with that being said, and your permission, I'll go straight to uh, my testimony. At the request of the applicant, uh, I have reviewed the proposed site plan, visited the site and the surrounding uh, area, which is uh, primarily residential homes. Uh, given the fact that this establishment and this operation has been in existence for many, many years in this location, uh, looking at uh, sales as it relates to homes within a half mile radius of the subject property, and then looking at homes beyond that half mile radius, uh, it appears that market data definitely support the fact that this uh, facility has had no impact on the surrounding of properties over the many years that has been there. Uh, given that to be the fact and the fact that there is a substantial amount of vegetation between the uh, playground and the adjoining neighborhood and that the ingress, egress points are not uh, changing in terms of traffic, it is my professional opinion that the St. Stephen's facility is in harmony with the surrounding area. It will have no adverse impact on market demand and or values and that this proposed use of a daycare uh, facility in conjunction with the already existing preschool will be in harmony. Uh, and with that being said, it is my professional opinion that uh, the grant of this special use permit will have no adverse impact uh, at all on any surrounding properties. Right. And I'm open for questions. Any questions for Mr. Martin? All right. Back to you, Marie. All right, thank you. We would just ask if there's any opposition that would like to speak before we conclude. Uh, is there any registered opponents to this case? Do we know of anybody here? Seeing none, hearing none. There is none, sir. Registered. All right, thank you. Um, so at this time, we would like to move into evidence. All exhibits relied on or referred to by the witnesses, including the staff report and um, the attachments. Right. Thank you, Sonoda. And um, just to, to summarize, as an applicant, we had the burden to submit competent material and substantial evidence into the record showing that our proposal meets all the requirements of the UDL for approval of the special use permit based on the review factors found in 3.9.8 A and B and the limited use requirements for daycare facilities found in 5.3.3 E. Uh, we have met this standard based on the testimony you've heard and therefore we ask for approval of the special use permit so that St. Stephen's can provide full days of care to its students at the preschool as opposed to half days. And again, our team will be ha happy to answer any questions if there are any, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for the applicant or any of the witnesses? Uh, Mr. Rechels. Uh, yes, uh, can someone tell me is the um, amount of children going to increase on that site once you extend the hours? I believe Kevin can address this. Um, he has all of the numbers. Uh, it is not expected to increase, no sir. So the, the expectation is that some of the students who attend St. Stephen's for the preschool will just shift into the, the full day or a longer day of daycare, but the total number of students or staff is not going to increase. Gotcha. Is there any kind of loudspeaker system outside of this um, that's, you know, loud? No, there is not. Uh, and uh, Mr. Dean, on the uh, service entrances, uh, is there going to be any change to trucks uh, coming in there to, to drop off goods or anything? No, sir. Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. All right, any other questions for the applicant or any of the witnesses? All right, um, Cole, do you have a recommendation for the board? Yes, uh, staff recommends approval um, with in accordance with everything that was submitted at this meeting. Okay, we've got a recommendation from staff. Is there any discussion? 
And if not, would anybody like to offer a motion? I will. I hereby make a motion that application number B2000029, an application for a minor special use permit for a daycare in a residential zoning district on property located to 82 Kimberly Drive has successfully met the, the requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. The improvement shall be substantially consistent with all information submitted to the board as part of the application. We've got a motion for approval by Ms. Beauchene. Is there a second? Kip second. A second by Mr. Kip. Jessica, take it away. Kip. Yes. Meadows. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Wretchless. Yes. Jeter. Yeah. Major. Yes. Boucher. Yes. Motion carries seven to zero approved. A uh, vote of seven to zero. Your request for a minor special use permit has been approved. We appreciate you coming for the BOA this morning and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Very, thank you very much for your time. Good day. All right. Um, Good job. We need a break. Anybody want a break? No? Yes? Continue? 10 minutes? 20 minutes? What do we want? Right at noon. We only have, we got two more cases. I would like a minimum of 15 minutes, please. Okay. Does that, does that work for everybody else? 15? All right. So I've got 12.02. Let's just do uh, 12.20, 18 minutes. Is that, I think that'll be good. We'll return at 12.20.
Um, as we return, this is Chris Peterson from the planning department. I have two Robert the Waskins. Um, as there is a second, um, I think I see probably the real Robert on here. Um, you know whom the other person may be? No, I don't. Uh, do, are you signed in on two different devices? Oh, or you... um, yes, that's my wife, Janet. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Looks like we may have everybody back. All right. Uh, Jessica, would you like to call the next case? Sure. This one has a correction to the agenda. This is a county case. B2100030, a county case. It's a request for a variance from the street yard setback. The subject site is located at 345 Continental Drive is zoned rural, residential rural, is in the Eno River Protected Area Water Protection Overlay, or EB, and in the suburban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time. Property owners within five, 600 feet have been notified and notarized affidavits verifying the sign posting and letter mailing are on file. The seating will be Kip, Meadows, Rogers, Wretchlists, Jeter, Major, and Boucheng. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, so we'll do the uh, we'll swearing in right now. Uh, so anybody who plans on giving testimony, if you'll raise your right hand, uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, Robert? Yes. Janet? Yes. yes. Uh, it must be in the same room, huh? Um, and do you consent to this remote meeting platform, Robert? Yes. And Janet? One more time. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. Um, Eliza, is this one yours? Yes, it is. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Eliza Monroe representing the planning department. Um, planning staff requests that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted. Thank you. Thank you. Case B210030 is a request for a variance from the street yard setback requirements. The applicant and property owner is Robert DeWaskin and Janet DeWaskin, and the subject site is located at 345 Continental Drive. The case area is highlighted in red on the screen. The site is zoned residential rural or RR and located within the Eno River protected area watershed protection overlay district and within the suburban development here. Uh, as you can see in the aerial, the site area is currently vacant and covered in um, trees and shrubs. So I'm gonna actually go two over. Um, so per section 6.2.1a of the Unified Development Ordinance, the required street yard setback for a single family dwelling structure in the RR zoning district is 50 feet. The applicant is proposing a reduction to 30 feet in order to build a single family house, which they believe will be consistent with the size of the homes within the neighborhood. And they also hope to have this setback in order to avoid the existing 50 foot stream buffer and 10 foot no build setback that's located towards the rear of the property. The site is located in the EB watershed protection overlay as we've noted here and although there are not specific house designs um, and they were not submitted at this time, staff would like to note that per UDO section 8.7.2b.1 there is a maximum impervious surface limit for the lot, um, and that would be a 24% impervious surface limit. So when they go through the building permit review process, they would have to stay below that. And also staff would like to note that for those of you that were with us in 2019, you probably recognize this site and or um, these drawings. Um, this was a case, uh, this was previously submitted and we did hear this back in 2019 under B1900040. 
Um, the previous permit has unfortunately expired um, and that is now considered null and void. So they had to come back in order to um, have that approval um, or potential approval done again since that a permit is expired. UDO section 3.14.8 establishes the four findings that the applicant must make in order for the board to grant a variance. These findings requiring approval are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings are identified in the application, both of which are within your packet and staff will be available for any questions as needed during the hearing process. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to the screen that's showing the proposed. Um, okay. Uh, any questions for Eliza before we hear from the applicant? All right. Um, well, would the applicant like to come forward? Which? Oh. Okay, that would be me. Yes. Uh, not really much to say. The This application for this variance was submitted in 2019. It was approved in October. And because of we, we had two years to develop a, a building permit, submit it and have that approved. And because of COVID, it's, we, we actually um, pretty much locked down for a year and a half. Um, my wife and I are both in our later years, and we had a pod with our, our family, our daughters, and, and we pretty much did not go anywhere for a year and a half. We did have, we did have uh, Tacla Engineering come out to look at um, what could be built on this site, and, and we also um, contacted a custom build uh, company, and they came out and gave us some ideas and, and gave us some proposed drawings and some proposed uh, plans to build a house there. But because of, of COVID, we really just never got uh, going on it. So because the, the permit, uh, the variance expires, uh, and we've learned that there's no way to get an extension on that, uh, we were told that we need to apply for a new one. So essentially, this is the same packet that we submitted in 2019. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right. Uh, any questions for the applicant? Um, I, I, I have one, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I'm just wondering, um, I, I see uh, on the exhibit that there's a red outline. I assume that's the building footprint that you would be anticipating. Um, would you, and I understand this is speculation, I'm just asking, if you're anticipating that this red outline, it would include any additional deck or patio or anything else that would need to be built um, and could potentially extend into, um, you know, the, the 10 foot no build or the riparian buffer. Uh, I don't know if you've given that any, any thought or, or have any thoughts about that question. Uh, no, because the, we, this, this is a really a unique area. This, this lot borders the Eno State Park. And uh, we're very much, I'm a, a semi-retired biologist of 35 years, uh, human health risk assessment. And, and we are both very active in preserving natural habitat. So we're very concerned about uh, having anything that would really disrupt the, the habitat or that would impact the stream in any which way. So that's why we, we're, uh, asking for the variance from the, the road. Um, we're interested in having minimal tree removal. Uh, we'll probably, you know, we were looking at a, a net zero energy. We currently have a geothermal system in our house. So we're, we're going to be very sensitive to anything that might disrupt the, the natural habitat. Uh, as far as whether a deck gets put on or not, um, it just depends on, on what the house plans are. But you can see in the, in the picture there, it shows the, the narrowest without the setback, the depth of that lot is 17.4 feet in the narrowest part of it. Uh, so we're asking for this 20 foot, um, this reduction from 50 to 30, to, to 30 feet. So we can have 37.4 feet of depth to build within. And that's, that's adequate for, for lanai's or other kinds of things that we could have within that footprint. But right now, no, I, 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 I would not be able to say exactly what the, the house plan would look like. Thank you. Yeah. It is on the it is on the left side because the right side is fairly steep. So we do need to to have it in pretty much where it is right there. 
All right, any other questions for the applicant? All right, uh, Eliza, would you mind stop sharing for a moment? All right. Uh, is there anyone else here to speak in favor of this application? Uh, is there anyone here to speak against this application? Seeing none. No one signed up in opposition. All right. Um, discussion, thoughts? Does anyone want to offer a motion? I hereby make a motion. This is Retchless that an application number B2100030 requests for a variance from the street yard setback requirements on property located at 345 Continental Drive has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions that improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of this application. All right, we've got a motion for approval by Mr. Rechless. Is there a second? Oh, Shane, second. Natalie, oh, Shane, second. Um, Jessica, would you call everyone? Yes. Kip? Yes. Meadows? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Rechless? Yes. Jeter? Major? Yes. And Bouchane? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero approved. Uh, by a vote of seven to zero, your request for a variance has been approved. We appreciate you coming for the BOA this morning and wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda has been removed. It was uh, case 31 at the end. We're gonna move on to the last uh, case. Um, and Jessica, would you like to call it? Our next case is B21-00033, a city case. A minor special use permit request to allow for increased height and expansion of floor area more than 10% of an existing non-conforming structure. The subject site is located at 914 Oakland Avenue, is zoned residential urban 52 or RU52 in the Old West neighborhood protection overlay and in the urban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time. Property owners within 600 feet have been notified and notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailing are on file. The seating will be Kip, Meadows, Rogers, Rechless, Jeter, Major, and Boucher. All right. Uh, everyone who plans on giving testimony will need to swear in. So if you don't mind, please raise your right hand. <laughs> You swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give today is the truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, Mr. Black. I swear. Ms. Randall. I swear. All right. Um, and do you um, consent to this remote meeting platform, Ms. Randall? Yes. Mr. Black. I do. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Cole, is this one yours? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Cole Renegar representing the planning department. Planning staff request the staff report and all materials submitted to the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted, thank you. My case B21000033 is a minor specialty permit to allow for increased height and expansion of floor area and more than 10% of an existing non conforming structure. This area is highlighted in red. The site is in the urban tier zone residential RU52 and is in the city of Durham's jurisdiction. The existing use is a single family dwelling. Um, John Black applicant requests a minor specialty permit in, um, to allow for an addition of a second story two and an expansion of the floor area of an existing non-conforming structure. This results in a height increase and floor area increase of more than 10%. There will also be a rear addition and a carport that meet all applicable UDO requirements and do not require minor special use. For UDO section 14.4.1C.3, additions or improvements to or reconstruction of non-conforming buildings and structures shall require a minor special use permit unless exempt. Additions must be consistent with the height of the original structure and can have up to an increase of 10% floor area. 
The proposed renovations increase the height of the building two feet and increase the floor area about 59.8%, resulting in the need for a modest special use permit. The, ex the existing structure is in the old Durham West Neighborhood Protection Overlay. UDO section 4.6.6 .6 restricts the maximum height of a building to 24 feet. The proposed structure is intended to be within this threshold and meets all other applicable restrictions from the applicable neighborhood protection overlay district. Staff will be loyal for questions throughout the hearing process. All right, any questions for Cole before we move on to the applicant? Hearing none, seeing none. Uh, would the applicant like to come forward? I have one question, Chair Rogers, for Cole. Yeah, Mr. Regis. Yes, was is the carport kind of what brought us over the limit is that considered the structure even though it's not living space so the carport is not um what brought us to the um what brought us to the i guess being from was mainly the second story um because that's increased i mean right now it's not it's not finished so now that it's becoming finished it basically adds another story of floor area that wasn't originally calculated living space okay thank you All right, any other questions for Cole? All right, uh, would the applicant like to come forward? Sure, uh, my name is John Black. I'm the designer of this project. I've been in residential design in, in Durham for the past six years, um, primarily with Riverbank construction. Um, so plenty of experience working on similar projects in this neighborhood and neighboring neighborhoods. Um, so we're very sensitive. I'm very sensitive to uh, respecting the, you know, the fabric of, of what's there. Um, we're not trying to uh, drastically change the appearance of the existing structure, just simply adding usable square footage so that the house better suits um, modern families that are moving into the neighborhood. Um, as you can see on the site plan, it's possible maybe if you zoom in a little more, but the addition that is proposed on the first floor um, is, is within the current setback requirements on the side of the lot, um, whereas the existing structure is over that setback requirement, thus making this a non-conforming structure. Um, so we did our best to keep the addition within the existing setback. And the second floor addition is also not going to change the appearance of this house from the street a great deal. As Cole already mentioned, we are proposing to increase the height by two feet, and that's mainly to make it usable, livable space upstairs. Um, but that existing single front dormer at the center of the, the front of the house with the shed roof, that will be replicated. Um, it will just be larger. And the existing form of that gable, the main gable of the house is also going to be replicated, just rebuilt again, two feet taller. Um, so with that, I am open to questions or comments. Any questions for the applicant? Oh, Mr. Retros, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Mr. Black, is uh, I'm not familiar with that overlay protection. Is that is anything going to uh, harm that overlay protection? Is that a city question? Maybe? So the, the, lar the largest concern with the neighborhood protection overlay is going to be the floor area ratio. Um, the amount of heated floor area that it is in the house compared to the size of the lot, the square footage of the lot. Um, so if, for example, if we were going to try to get this same amount of square footage in a single story addition without altering that, that roof structure, we would eat up all of that surface area and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to achieve it. So it made the most sense to go up to a second story um, and not take up more ground area on the lot. Um, and that by doing that, that, that's why we had to, to rebuild the roof. Understood, thank you. Are there any other questions for the applicant? All right.
right. Um, Cole, would you mind stop sharing for a moment? And is there anyone else here to speak in favor of this application? Reminder such use, I don't see anybody. Looks like we have one person to speak against. Uh, Ms. Randall, do you have anything to say? Uh, yes, thank you. I actually am in favor of expanding the house and I think it will bring good value and I'll be a good neighbor for that, Mr. Black. My concerns really are about the proposed driveway and possibly the carport and its potential impact on my property next door. I live at 912 Oakland on the south side of 914. Um, given the existence of the utility poles between the two properties, front and back, um, the existing uh, apron, part of which is on my property, um, the side yard sizing, which is quite small between the two houses. Um, I have some questions really about the design. So I wanted to run those down. A um, couple asks, additional thought, and then reiteration of it looks like a good design overall, but I would like these questions addressed. Um, my questions are, you know, regarding the side yard setback in the driveway, is the driveway, which is essentially looking like it's being built on the property line, and then the edge of the structure truly compliant? Um, my other questions are, you know, will a driveway and a carport in the middle of the backyard fit within the historic nature of the neighborhood? Um, what is my remedy? Should construction or use of this driveway encroach upon my property line? Um, I would like to ask that um, if necessary, we have an updated survey. I'm also a little concerned about where the placement of the gas lines are because you're talking about removing your gas pack, but I still have mine out there. So if we put a hardscape over the gas line, that would be a concern. Um, and finally, um, would ask that you clearly mark the survey corners and clearly mark the driveway before pouring concrete. Um, my one additional question really is about the backyard canopy. I understand the need to take out the tree. Uh, where you're putting in additional tree, there is actually quite a bit of existing canopy. So I think that could be problematic as far as that canopy covers my backyard. Um, and you know, I'm not looking for encroachment or easement here, but want to be a good neighbor because I think having a single family home with long-term family in it would be benefit to us all in the neighborhood. That's it. Um, staff would like to mention that the carport and the driveway are as shown. Um, they meet all the applicable UDA requirements. Um, so the variance isn't actually for those additions. Um, we just wanna make the board aware of those additions. Um, most of the concerns that Ms. Um, Randall had would most likely uh, be addressed in um, the building permit review as far as setbacks and um, those kind of questions as far as having an updated survey would be shown when this is put in for review. Um, so most of those concerns um, would be addressed during that time um, and would show everything. If, if John Black would like to add anything that I didn't address or that Ms. Randall brought up on um, the board, I mean, I guess the chair will allow you to, to speak. Okay. <laughs> Would you mind just reminding us what is at state? What is what? What's at the question before us? So the question before us is for um, an, a ten percent addition of floor area. Um, that doesn't include carport or driveway. Um, that just includes the extra livable space, um, which is basically the second story. Yeah. Um, and also, Mr. Meadows had a question. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's um, you know that again you know. Board of Adjustments quite a, quite a little bit different than most uh, legislative bodies. This is a quasi judicial um, that we, we are only really going to consider what it, the question is before us and not all this other. Uh, while it certainly may affect, uh, it's just not within our purview. Uh, and um, Chad, do you have a question before I have? Okay. And uh, Mr. Black, you do have the opportunity to address and uh, provide any rebuttal. Sure. Um, I will speak for the owner, um, even though some of what you brought up is out of my uh, realm, um, because I will not really be involved in the construction process. However, I am acquainted with the owner and um, could certainly put you in touch with the owner 
because I can say that the owner is willing to work with you as the neighbor to make sure that the whole process goes smoothly and that, um, you know, nothing detracts from your property or experience of your property during the project. Um, like regarding the, the tree that's proposed in the backyard, completely flexible. But, you know, that's not something that I'm putting my foot down on. It needs to be here. I'm sure the homeowner feels the same way. We'd be willing to work with you on the exact location of the newly proposed tree. Um, and as far as like the gas lines, obviously as Cole brought up during permitting and inspections, um, I, we wouldn't even be able to build without knowing where those lines are going and that everything is safe. Um, so all that would be inspected prior to digging and pouring a driveway. Um, the utility poles, the light poles that are currently kind of between the two houses, they are proposing to remove those. Um, so if that's something you did not wish to see happen, I'm sure we could talk to the homeowner about that but they're proposing to remove those to make way for the driveway and access to the backyard. Um, and you're correct in assuming that the proposed driveway would go to the property line, and then it would also go all the way to the, the house. Um, and that will give enough width for a car to make it by the house to the backyard. And just let me know if I forgot to address anything else. See? Right. Um, from what I can see from the existing pipe, the utility pole in front is actually on my property. So I think there'd be need to be a little more discussion there and also seeing what is going to be replacing it. Um, in terms of water runoff, you know, I'm curious about the design of this because there is so little space between the foundations of the two houses. I understand your statement, Mr. Rogers, about um, BOA's purvey but I also put it before you all that this part of the design is a substantial impact potential um, and should be considered perhaps in the future, if not for me. Um, you know, one of the things I am concerned about is encroachment um, and wanna make sure that we work this out. I understand this may not be the forum, but um, that is not, you know, obviously clear to surrounding homeowners where we can get these addressed as well. So thank you. Seems like most of these would be with, uh, you know, enforcement issues as well. Um, you know, there should not be any impacts um, you know, spilling over, uh, but I, under, I totally understand your uh, concerns. All right, um, anyone else? Um, all right, so this is a minor special use permit. Cole, do you have a recommendation for the group? Um, staff recommends approval um, consistent with everything that was submitted in the application to the board. All right, we have a recommendation by staff. Uh, discussion? Thoughts? Right now, we're just at being asked about the extension up to the second floor, and that's what's under our purview at this moment. Is that correct? Yes. Not the. That's correct. <clears throat> um, Ratchless, being where we're, we're only going two feet uh, beyond um, the standard. Um, I like the design. Um, I think it's fair to the neighborhood, and uh, I'm, in, I'm, in, uh, I'm for this uh, S, uh, MSCP. Anyone else? All right, does anyone want to make a motion? or further discussion. Uh, 
this is Meadows. I will do it as soon as I get to the language. Just give me a second, please. Got it. Okay. Um, I hereby make a motion that application number B2000033, an application for a minor special use permit to allow for increased height and expansion of floor area more than 10% of an existing non-conforming structure on property located at 914 Oakland Avenue, has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. One, that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with all information submitted to the board as part of the application. Got a motion for approval by Mr. Meadows. Is there a second? I'll Here. second that. All right, both Shane second. Uh, Jessica? Right. Kip? Yes. Meadows? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Retchless? Yes. Jeter? Yes. Major? Yes. And Boucher? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero approved. A uh, vote of seven to zero. Your request for a minor special use permit has been approved. We uh, thank you for her coming before the BOA this morning and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to move along on the agenda here. Uh, we have no old business. I don't think we've heard any new business uh, to be added. We have that brings us to the approval of the orders. We've got a few here, um, and I've got a question for for one, someone. The B two one, the second one on the list, twenty two, uh, is that from a previous? As from, from last last month, okay. Uh, yeah, we, Mr. Chair, uh, Christian Cooker, City Attorney's Office. That was the case. Um, the Amazon wall. Um, and uh, the order is not ready for that one, so we won't be voting on that one today. All right, so we'll need a motion. We can make this uh, real quick, and but uh, usually in person, this is a little bit quicker, but so we'll need a motion and a second, and we have to all vote um, individually for each one of these. On the first one, B2100011, uh, Chad, you're going to sit out on this one. Yep. Uh, and so uh, I need a motion. Ratchless motion. Retchless, is there a second? Could be any of you who sat in on this. Yep, second. Yep. Jessica? Okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure if anybody was missing for that one. I apologize, but I will call everyone but Meadows that's here today. Does that yep. sound right? Okay. Out. So, Kip? Yes. Rogers? Yes. Retchless. Yes. Jeter. Yeah. And then um, who was the alternate? Do you know, Rogers? Natalie. Boucher. Natalie. I think I sat and in Boucher. on that one. Okay, I so Boucher. I, sat, I don't think I sat in on that one. You don't think so? Well, we had to have at least one uh, alternate sit in today. So I believe Boucher was on all of them. Yeah. Oh. oh you were on that one. I was. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay, <laughs> so that would be six to zero approved. No, wait a minute. What you got, Brian? Was Tisha on that one? Tisha, Tisha voted on that one, but she left. So she be five zero. did not vote on that. Yes, she did. We've had a, we've had a, a alternate on all of these cases. We're missing a member. Does Miss DeLacy is no longer here? We've had an alternate for all cases. Well, I know, I know that uh, that she was there on that case. Mm -hmm. I remember I, she voted on that case. That's why we're you mean? Eleven we heard today, so uh, the one we're looking at today. So Natalie, oh, voted. oh, eleven, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I thought I thought you were talking about last month. No, the the it's the first uh, case on the agenda for today. Yeah, that's me. Yes. <laughs> so without Chad. And with Ms. Bouchane filling in, that would be six to zero approved. Okay. So just so just so I'm clear, uh, there was one board member that left. Yes. Tisha. She left. Tisha. She voted on that case, right? Yes. She did vote on the first one. Five zero. 
Right. Gotcha. And, and okay, all right. So she did right, and there was no. A, yeah, it would be five zero. The motion would be five zero since she's no longer here, and Chad voted no, so it should be five zero. Right. So right. Six. Okay. Okay. All right. right. Gotcha. All right, moving on. Uh, B21000025. This is a unanimous vote. Anyone can vote. Who wants to offer the motion? Meadows, move approval. Meadows, who's the second? Rachel, second. Rachel, second. And, and just, was, was Weimar, Weimar was here still for this one? Correct, yes. Yes. Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah. Kip. Yes. Meadows. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Wretchless. Yes. Wymore is gone. So sorry. Jeter. Yes. And Boucher. Sorry. I don't know yes. why this is so hard every week. <laughs> <laughs> every month. Uh, all right. Uh, next one. B21000027. Another unanimous vote. Who wants to take the motion? I move that we approve. Jeter. Jeter. Who's the second? Boucher second. Jean. Okay. Kip. Yes. Meadows. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Wretchless. Yes. Jeter. Yes. And Boucher. Yes. Righty. Uh, next one, B21000287. This is another unanimous vote. But this one had opposition, right? So, so we'll pull I'm that one. one. All right. Pull it. B21000029, unanimous vote again. Who wants to take it? Ratchless. Ratchless it is. Meadows, Who's Meadows second. Meadows second. So, Miss Wymore was gone by this one, this correct? One. Okay. So then we have Kip. Yes. Meadows. Yes. Rogers. You say yes, Mr. Rogers. Sorry, yes. Okay. Uh, Retchless. Yes. Jeter. Yeah. Major. Yes. Roshan. Yes. Okay, so that was seven zero. Ready. Um, the next one is B two one zero 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 three zero. Another unanimous vote. Um, I think this did this one also have. No, the last one had it. Sorry. Um, three zero. Who wants it? Gretchless, all right. Sure. All right, who's the second? Meadows. Jeter. Ah, Jeter. All right, we'll go with Jeter. Kip. Yes. Meadows. Yes. Rogers. Yes. Gretchless. Yes. Jeter. Yeah. Major. Yes. Boucher. Yes. Seven to zero. Cool. All right, uh, 31 was postponed, 33 had opposition. Do you want to postpone that as well, Krista? Or is that a county, that's a county case or city case, that's right. I'll wait for next month to approve that one. All right, got yeah, it. 33 postponed. All right, our next meeting is Tuesday, August 24th. And we have a training on the morning of August 17th. Uh, you probably got a email from Jessica, I was yesterday, so uh, nine to noon. Nine to noon. All right, virtual as well. So I hope everybody can change attend that. Jessica, you got something? Uh, when is the date for the November, December meeting? I don't have that on my calendar yet. So we don't actually, um, Eliza Monroe Planning, so we don't actually have a November meeting that, or excuse me, yes, a no November meeting. That's when we have our recess. Um, and then the December meeting is actually the second Tuesday of the month, which is going to be the 14th of December. Thank you. So you have it off in November, and then we have one the second Tuesday of the month in December. And at that December meeting, we'll bring the calendar for next year for approval. Good. All right. Anybody got anything else? Uh, are we, uh, Rachel, so are we, we're going to continue Zoom, I assume, through the rest of the year? Uh, from what I hear, council's thinking about a hybrid options for stuff in, next month. Okay. We actually need to have right. approval from city council to meet right. in person. And so they're still working out the details of that and test running the hybrid first. Thank you. All right, guys, one o'clock. What was that? Five, six hours? I don't know. Four hours. Good. Uh, got done pretty good. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all then. See you on the 24th. Have a good week.